Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. This is our second annual GAC Leadership Con uh, Summit. Uh, we're really happy to have you all here. Uh, we uh, are doing things a little bit differently today uh, due to everything that's going on. Um, instead of having individual speakers at the individual times, we're going to be doing a panel. And um, I'm going to take a second to uh, introduce everybody that we have on the panel um, and you guys, so that way you guys can kind of talk a little bit about, you know, you know, where you are and what you do. If, if, if anybody may have missed, um, you know, some of the things that we were posting out on our emails and stuff like that to kind of introduce you all, I'd like to give the audience here um, that's watching on the live as well as on the replays to get a chance to, you know, uh, hear from you, um, understand where you, where you're from and who, uh, what organization you're with and um you know a little bit about you and then uh we'll we'll get into some networking and talk to everybody else that's on here as well all right so uh with that being said um i want to start off with uh, ladies first uh rose legis good morning good morning good morning so you want me to introduce myself yeah okay all right so i am rose legis um born and raised well born in miami raised in south florida delray beach if anybody knows uh that city um came up to ucf um and majored in engineering industrial engineering worked out at uh, kennedy space center for about 15 16 years um in 2019 a uh, contract was ending decided to um, fulfill my dream of um, being my own boss and started up my own engineering and tech uh, consulting firm. Um, and I've been doing that since then. Uh, also, uh, in 2019, I joined the leadership team of Black Orlando Tech. And this year, I became the organization's executive director. Um, the nonprofit focuses on uh, workforce development, small business development, socioeconomic uh, we focus on underrepresented uh, communities with a specific focus on uh, Black and Brown individuals. Um, we have a number of uh, awesome programs, and our key objective is basically to accelerate the economic advancement of um, underrepresented communities uh, by pivoting them into tech, either in a, um, in a career or entrepreneurship. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right. And then I'm going to slide over to uh, Maritza Rabinowitz. Good morning. Hi, everyone. Hi, good morning. Well, my name again is Maritza Rabinowitz, and I'm actually, I work for the IRS. I work for the Office Stakeholder Liaison, and it's under the Communication and Liaison Office of the IRS. Uh, born in New York, uh, raised in St. Thomas and Puerto Rico, and been in Florida uh, for the last 26 years. Um, my um, office supports uh, business communities, uh, the tax professional organization. Also, we have responsibility for disaster programs and anything that has to do with education. Uh, for the last couple of years, we've been working a lot with um, community community based organization and nonprofit organization assisting with different uh, messages to the community. So very thank you. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much. All right, Trey, Mr. Trey Austin, I got you up next. All right. Well, good morning. It's such a pleasure meeting everyone uh, virtually. Um, my name is Trey Austin. I am the Director of Lending for BBIF. Um, my background is predominantly in, in corporate banking. I've been in corporate banking for at least at least 20 years. Um, eventually, it got to a point to where I was overseeing a CRA or Community Reinvestment Re um, Act uh, area and found that it was very, very challenging to get uh, minority and, and black owned businesses approved for small business lending. And so, which led me to seek out different alternative ways of lending um, that would be able to help those small business get access, businesses get access to capital, which led me then to discovering what the CDFR uh, was and what they had the capacity to be able to do as it pertains to be able to, uh, as it pertains to bringing access to capital to underrepresented businesses. And, um, you know, long story short, I'm here <laughs> with BBIF, 
gives me a wonderful opportunity to have conversations with businesses I would not have otherwise been able to speak with. Um, so, you know, it's, it's definitely purposeful work. Um, what we do is uh, essentially two things. Uh, we, uh, we provide capital and consulting to businesses that, that need it. So we discovered early on that you just can't uh, give a small business money and say, hey, go out there and figure out a way to pay us back. So, you know, uh, we just figured out a way uh, and we understood that, you know, being a, a presence, having a fiduciary responsibility to helping these businesses grow and continue to be viable and sustainable uh, works best. And so um, that's what I've been doing for the past three years. So pleasure um, meeting with you all. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. And next I have Socrates. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Socrates Exantis. I was actually born in Haiti, but grew up in South Florida, Pompano Beach. Went to UCF and graduated in 2000 and with a degree in MIS and a minor in biology. Went on to get my master's degree and worked in corporate for 15 years. But in 2010, I left corporate to be a business owner. I now own and operate uh, a property management firm, which has offices in four locations throughout Florida. We have office in Jacksonville, office in South Florida, and two offices here. We manage well over 1,200 properties for institutional investors and just regular investors who have uh, rental properties. Uh, I'm also an assistant professor at the UCF, uh, the College of Business, Finance, and Real Estate Department. Uh, last year, we launched a foundation called the Legacy Cornerstone Foundation. We raised nearly $50,000 for black and brown students across the country. We gave 100% we gave of the funds away to these uh, students that earn those scholarships. So I'm really passionate about that. I'm also a member of the CEO Exchange, which, uh, which is a mastermind for business owners. We grew our business from 2010 to now to become a $4 million business. And so we're actively involved in the community in terms of mastermind and helping other businesses grow their business and finding their passion. That's a little bit about me. So I'm looking forward to interacting with some of the folks on the call and learning more and sharing as much as I can. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for all our panel members. Um, I'm going to take a second and step back where um, I want to introduce our uh, our chairman, Dr. Ilder Bunam, um, and he can tell all of you if you are not yet familiar with uh, with the chamber, um, all the things that we offer and all the things that we do for the community and business members. So, uh, with that being said, Dr. B, take it away. Good morning. Good morning. Bonjour tout le monde. <laughs> As uh, JP mentioned, Jean mentioned, my name is Dr. Ilder Bunam. I'm a physical therapist here in the Iroko. Uh, area serving the Pine Hills, West Orlando. So I call myself the biomechanic, but I also have the privilege of serving as the president for the Greater Haitian American Chamber of Commerce. So give me a second. I'm going to pull up my uh, PowerPoint just to give you an overview of the chamber, and then we'll move on forward. All right, here we are. So again, the uh, chamber was formed in 2007 as a civic organization uh, to serve the community here in the Orlando area. Again, I welcome you to our uh, there we go. So welcome you to our second annual Business Leadership Summit. Thank you to uh, Trey Olson with BBIF, Wars Legis with BOT, and Socrates Exantis, Socrates Exantis with Clark County Property Management. Thank you for taking the time to uh, give back to our community. Each year uh, when we do this uh, event, we look for individuals within our community, uh, experts within our community to give back to us, to our community, and especially the board as well, where we get to sit back and be poured onto uh, and be given insight because as leaders as well, we need to be uh, refreshed and refueled. So this is an opportunity, but also uh, again, to engage our community. 
thank you guys for, for your commitment uh, and for uh, your resources. Again, Dr. B, President of the Haitian Chamber. So what is our mission? Our mission is to provide Haitian American businessmen and women that will support, facilitate, and foster and economic development in the Orlando area in the United States and abroad. What does that look like? It goes by membership. So we build membership where we have collective mind, collective individuals, work, where we say iron, sharp and iron, so we can help develop professionally in our businesses. What's our purpose? To facilitate an economic development, both in the Orlando area, to provide information, resources, to serve as a liaison, but also to promote trade between our Haitian American businesses, different levels of government within the state of Florida and abroad. But also to assist and train our members. So we they establish, maintain their business, and as Socrates mentioned earlier too, so we can grow and expand. Because we continue to expand our footprints in the area, it is uh, vital uh, that we are equipped to be able to do those things. And hence why we have this summit today, so we get brought on to. So typically, someone will ask, why should I join the timber? What's the benefit? Why be involved with, with, with an association? Relationship building, that's a must. Uh, yes, we usually say you build it, they'll come. But if they do not trust you, if they don't know the product you're delivering, if you don't have that connection with those individuals, they'll go away and spend their resources somewhere else. So it's important that we actually be present. The membership is important, but more importantly, your presence. Uh, we need to engage. Business advocacy. As I learn about you, as I develop a relationship with you, I can be an advocate for your business. I can be an advocate for you. Credibility and value. Again, uh, validation. Resource and training, as we are here this morning. Uh, relationship with industry experts, where if you're looking for a mentor, but also to be held accountable, this is the organization for you. Exposure, marketing, visibility. It all ties to relationship. Again, and of course, giving back to the community. It's an opportunity for you, your experts, your high achievers, whatever industry you're in, the success that you've had, come back and point to us those that are inspired to be the same or to develop, that they can avoid the, the same mistakes or pitfalls that we made. They don't have to go through that again. And this is where your, your time, your resources is important as you achieve those successes to come back and pour in into our community. Again, I thank our panelists for that. <clears throat> Excuse me. A quick year in review, uh, what we've done, uh, if no one, knows or if you here have not heard about the chamber or you didn't know the chamber uh, engaged in these sort of, sort of activities. Uh, I think earlier last year, 2020, we did a brand uh, summit. We also had a typically every Thursday, uh, every second Thursday, every third Thursday, we hold our Let's Connect, where it's an opportunity before, before COVID, uh, we used to have it at individual businesses or members' businesses where you get to share your story we bring out our members, our community, and we have a 30 minute presentation and network. Unfortunately, due to COVID, we shift that, we did it virtually. So we've been doing that for the past year and a half now, virtually. So we did the uh, opening of business with Orange County. There are certain nuances that many uh, in our community, and I think I've had that conversation with uh, Socrates and he might be, uh, I don't wanna steal his number, he might be mentioning this too as well later on, but there's a lot of nuances that we're not aware of or we are, but never complete the process thoroughly. So when you get engaged with these organizations, we can avoid that. We did financial growth uh, for your business. Uh, we did pivot and prospering. When you have a pandemic that's hitting you left and right, uh, shortfall of resources, uh, mental stress, emotional stress, how do you shift? How do you keep that business run? Or do you have the resources, the capacity to operate? Last year, we did our business summit, and I have that here uh, with our past speakers as well, and also engage with the uh, Haitian Culinary Alliance here in Central Florida and, and uh, South Florida. So basically, they're a group of Haitian chefs uh, that collaborates together and host this event during May, Haitian Heritage Month, 
to expose our culture, our cuisines to our community. Uh, earlier in the year, we started with our installation with uh, uh, Orange County Mayor Demings. Again, that was done virtually. So if you look at the, the screen here in the top right, that's the event that took place. And then unfortunately, we had a few uh, mishaps, tragedy that continues to happen in our beloved country, Haiti. Uh, we held a virtual uh, for the late uh, presidential of NEM and the uh, Bonnet Park, where we have collaboration with Commissioner uh, Terry Sipling. And also, we had an opportunity to meet and engage with the Haitian Council here where we met and identified strategies where we may work collaboratively to engage the community, but also uh, to develop and gain data, resources, and information for our community. And of course, we go around periodically uh, to celebrate and acknowledge our uh, large business uh, members by presenting with a plaque. Uh, so those are just a few uh, things that we do that we're able to do, but to be able to continue that, we need your members, we need our members to be engaged. We need those that are not members to get involved and help us expand our footprints. So having said that, you know, I would ask you if you're not a member, uh, if you have a friend uh, that aspires to uh, develop a business or that wants to grow uh, professionally or that wants to be mentored, uh, we ask you, where do you see yourself? Okay, this is our list of, of, of membership, very affordable. Uh, Student, $20 a year. Professionals, $60 a year. Small business, there's a typo there, supposed to be five or less for 200 for small business. And then large business, which is five and above, uh, 500. And there are other levels as well for uh, corporate and trustee sponsors. But here, this is what we have listed. So it's very affordable, but more importantly, is to engage and develop the relationships. So where do you see yourself? Scholarship, we launched that last year as well. Uh, this year we awarded a few scholarships, uh, one to a, a student at Dr. Phillips, but also uh, Club Creole at, yeah, at UCF. And again, we continue to look for partnership uh, that can help us grow and continue to fund this program so we can have uh, further reach into the community. Great thank you to our board, to our members, to our panelists, and of course, our planning committee, uh, Jean-Pierre Pierre, Abigail. And of course, this was our, our gala we did back in 2019 at the Rosens. Uh, last year was canceled. Uh, this year, uh, we're planning it, but again, it may uh, we're gonna do something a little bit different, so stay tuned for that information. Again, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us, uh, our panelists. Thank you for your time. Uh, JP, I'll turn it back to you. All right, fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. B. I really appreciate that. Um, if any of you have any questions, uh, or, or, or actually, I'll, I'll put in a link here in the chat in a second about uh, where you can join, um, and then you also get more information uh, and see some more literature that we have on the GAC website, but it is GAC.org. Um, I want to take a few minutes here, um, and I meant to do this before, and I, and I kind of jumped the gun, but for everybody that's here, we have a lot of people on, and that's awesome. Thank you for joining us. Um, if you have a business or you have a, uh, a, 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 if you're an entrepreneur or if you're about to get into, uh, into starting a business, um, I want you to take a second and uh, introduce yourself in the chat. Um, so if you have, you know, your name, if you have an email address or a phone number or what your business name is and what you offer, um, go ahead and put that in the chat. Um, what will happen is, is that for everybody else that's on here, um, if they see something that you offer and it's something that they're looking for, it'd be a great opportunity to be able to uh, connect. So um, our, you know, our, our network, our, our, our consistent networking feature is Let's Connect. And so um, since we're on this digital platform, we're able to do that. You get some exposure here. So take a minute, use the chat. Um, if, if, if depending on how familiar or when the last time you used uh, Zoom, um, you may have to hit the drop down to make sure you're sending your message to everyone so everybody could see it. But again, you know, just take a second, type in your name, uh, your, uh, your, your business and organization name and an email address if you want to have people contact you that way. A short description of what you offer, what products or services that you offer. Um, and then, you know, like I said, a, a means for people to be able to contact you. Maybe that's phone number, maybe that's email, maybe that's your website. Go ahead and plug that in there. And then um, if the conversations, you know, need to go on, you can hit the little drop down to be able to uh, send a message directly to someone. 
Uh, but yeah, take the opportunity to network. And uh, again, thank you all for being here. All right. And so while you all are doing that, um, I'm also going to ask that if you have any questions for our panel members, you had a minute to hear from each of them um, that, uh, you know, what they offer and what they do, uh, what organizations they're from um, and what their expertises are and what their backgrounds are. So uh, we have a, a, a lot uh, of really good uh, information from them that they're going to be able to provide from you based on their experiences and their education and, um, and, and accolades. So um, if you have questions uh, either directly for them or that you'd like to have asked uh, for, for everybody on the panel to be able to answer, um, take a minute and go ahead and type those in to the chat as well. Um, we have some pre-submitted questions, so we'll we'll start off with that um, in a little bit. But in the meantime, if you have any questions off the top of your mind that you'd like to ask, I'll go to, I'm going to do those in order. Take a minute, go ahead and go through the chat, and then go ahead and type those in, um, and that'll be awesome. Okay, so uh, we also have a special guest that I'm very very excited um, uh, that she reached out to our, our organization a couple weeks ago. And um, because there's been a lot of conversation about the child uh, child tax credit, um, and I personally have seen some 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 things come through my inbox, and I've seen some headlines, but I didn't really understand much about it. I'm very happy to introduce uh, Marita Rabinowitz. Um, she's going to talk about that, and so um, she's also got some literature that she's going to share, and she's provided us. Uh, literature in three different languages so uh, we're going to be able to you know uh share those after um there's some links that i'll put in here as well uh, if you can you, you'll be able to join it online but uh and see some of the literature online but then afterwards we're going to sum all this stuff up and we'll be able to share that with you as well so with that being said i'm going to uh give you the floor Marisa. take it away thank you so much um Jean, and good morning to everyone and before I start my presentation, I, I cannot thank. Um, I'm so appreciative of this opportunity. So um, I would like to thank Jean and the Greater Haitian American Chamber of Commerce for this opportunity to be able to reach out um, and share some information about the child tax credit and the advance payment child tax credit that many families have been receiving since July 15. Now, if you allow me one moment, I am going to um, share my um, presentation. Okay, let me make sure. And Jean, please let me know um, once you can um, see my presentation. You got it, you got it, okay. Not just yet. Not yet. Oh, here it's coming up. There we go. All right, you're live. No, let me check. Bear with me because I think that's a different one. Oh, uh, so okay. I'm going to stop sh sharing this one. Okay. 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 So I'm seeing a lot of contact information while well, I need to pull this up, but I'm seeing a lot of uh, contact information in the chat. That's awesome. Um, like I said, be sure to take a look at that. And if anything, copy um, some of that information if you're looking to communicate with uh, some of these business and professionals and um, you know, look forward to networking. And Gene, if this doesn't work, um, I could see my presentation, but if it doesn't work, you have my presentation just in case, right? Mm -hmm. I do. I can go ahead and pull that up in just a second here. Yep. And then here we go. Okay, I have the the um the p the PDF version. You have the PDF. Mm -hmm. Let me know. I see you're you're about to start sharing. So let's. See. If you got it, that's cool. If not, I can bring it up. Oh, yes, I think I was almost about um, to be able to share um, okay. the, the presentation. I think this is the one. Um, it's just we've been doing so many presentations, some, you know, <laughs> longer than others. And that's why I have multiple um, yeah. presentations. So I'm going to see if this is the one. Okay. 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 Um, let me know. I 
Are you seeing or not? I do. I see um, this one is in Spanish, though. Uh, okay. So you're going to have to share then. Okay. Please. No problem. No problem. Okay. All right. So I will share. Oh, there it goes. And then I'll tell you next if that's okay. Mm hmm. Okay. Okay. How's it? Right. It's perfect. Thank right. you. Thank you so much. And again, um, this message um, that I will be speaking to you about, we've been doing a lot of presentation and outreach because of the importance of this message. I, I will be speaking today about the changes of 2021, child tax credit, and again, the advanced payments. Um, next. I'll be covering basically what's new about the child tax credit in 2021. And actually um, this particular change came about the American Rescue Plan. And it not only affects at the time when next year, when taxpayers file their returns, but it also has affected the calendar year. That's why you've been seeing the advanced child tax credit, these advanced payments. Um, I'm going to briefly speak about eligibility in terms of taxpayers and the dependent child. And again, address these advanced payments, what they are and why these amounts. And also speaking about various tools we have online. There's one specific that we call it the portal for unenroll and updates. And then I'm going to share information about what my taxpayers need to do in certain situations. Next. The child tax credit again, uh, and this changes on, only affects to 2021. And again, it comes as a result of the American Rescue Plan. It raises the maximum qualifying age. Last year in 2020, the children age 16 and under qualify for the child tax credit. For 2021, now the change is children age 17. Therefore, this year, there will be more families that will be able to benefit from the child tax credit because it includes children 17 years of age. Next. It increases the maximum credit amount. In 2020, the child tax credit was 2,000, and there was no distinction among ages. So it was 2,000, but up to children 16 and under. Well, this for 2021, the amounts increase, and again, I mentioned that now children 17 also qualify. But the amounts are, and it is a distinction between ages. So it's up to 3,000 per children age 6 and 17, and up to 3,600 per children under age 6. And keep in mind that this is per children. So there's quite a significant amount in terms of the increase and the difference in age. Next. It makes the credit fully refundable. In 2020, they, uh, up to 1,400 an individual would have been able uh, to benefit if they would not have been able to use the entire amount of the child tax credit. In 2020, there's no refund limit amount. In other words, uh, in 2020, when an individual benefited from the child tax credit, it was because there was a tax liability. And that child tax credit of 2000 in 2020 was used to reduce the tax liability. For 2021, the individuals does not have to have any tax liability to benefit from these increased amounts. Now, when an individual in the past, again, did not take benefit from the entire amount of child tax credit of 2000, then there was another law of provision that would come into play that it was called the additional child tax credit, which also was used to calculate if a taxpayer still would be able to benefit even though the entire amount was not used because of the tax liability. This is what we mean that up to still 1400, someone maybe would have been able to benefit even if the tax liability was not enough. But again, in 2021, this no longer is applicable 
So the total amount will be, uh, be again, refunded to the taxpayer without having to have that tax liability. Next. Now it removes the minimum earned income requirement in 2020 for an individual, again, to be able to benefit from the entire child tax credit with the additional tax credit if that provision would come into play in calculation, at least the individual had to have 2,500 of earned income requirement. For the 2021, that is removed, which means a taxpayer does not have to have any income to qualify for the child tax credit. So that's why we mentioned in 2021 is zero, the requirement for earned income. Next. So a taxpayer, there's a requirement that a taxpayer claiming the child tax credit must have a principal place of residence in the United States for more than half of the taxable year. But I have to make um, also let you know that even if a taxpayer does not live in the U.S. for more than half of the year, a taxpayer could still benefit from these new increases. The only difference will be that their calculation will be based, made based on the, their tax liability. So for the individuals that live in the United States for more than half of the year, again, there's the tax liability does not come into play. But for those individuals that do not meet this particular uh, requirement, they still might be able to benefit from the, these increases. But the only thing we will be using the past um, computation that we had in 2020, and yet they will be able still to benefit from those increases. Also, U.S. military personnel stationed outside of the United States are considered to have a principal place of residence in the U.S. if more than half of the taxable year, if they are on active duty in excess of 90 days or indefinitely, period. Next. The taxpayer must have a social security number or they could also have an individual taxpayer identification number of known as ITIN. The ITIN number is a number that the IRS issues taxpayers when they have a tax responsibility and they are not eligible for social security card. Next. Qualifying children. Let's speak very briefly about what are the requirements. The child must be claimed as a dependent on the taxpayer's return. The child is under 18 as of the end of tax year 2021. The taxpayer's child, stepchild, whether blood or adoption, foster child, sibling, step-sibling, or a descendant of one of these. And the child has the same principal resident as the taxpayers for more than half of the year. Now, it's important that there's exceptions in terms of the residence. Why? Because sometimes um, a child can be a dependent of one uh, parent and, and the, the parent who has the right to claim it maybe because of a divorce decree or maybe temporary absences. So there still might be an opportunity for a child that doesn't meet this requirement to still be a qualifying child. Next. The child did not provide himself or herself more than half of their own support for the tax year. Now, we might not be seeing this part so much of the joint return, but this is a, a requirement for all dependents. But because we're dealing here with younger uh, children, this might not apply, but still I have to mention, if married, the child did not file a joint return for the tax year unless that return was being filed only to claim a refund and there was no tax liability if either spouse would have filed a separate return. Uh, again, we might not be seeing these, but it has to be mentioned. Citizenship. The child must be a U.S. citizen, U.S. national, or U.S. resident. Million. And the child must have a Social Security issue before the due date of the return, including extensions. Next. Now, how is it that the IRS has calculated and how do we get these numbers that families have been receiving since July 15? 
It's based on the most current year. For example, the tax, the IRS has looked at the 2020 tax return information containing that 2020 return. And if the tax, if we don't have a return for a specific taxpayer for 2020, we look at the 2019. From that return, we look and we estimate what will be the child tax credit that that taxpayer would be entitled next year at the time of filing. And 50% of that amount is estimated and given to the taxpayers in six different payments. So actually, that's why we call them advance payment, because they are actually receiving payments that will be related with the child tax credit next year. The payment started in July 15, and every month the taxpayer will receive the amounts, the equivalent, to 250 for those that have children 6 to 17, or 300 for those that have children that are 5 or under. Now, there is a portal for taxpayers to make updates. Um, why would someone make updates? because possible for next year, the person might not have a dependent. Um, so I'll speak a little about that further down. Uh, next. Now this is our IRS, um, our main page, and I'm illustrating where we have information about the advanced child tax credit payment, and I have it circle. Next. Now I'm showing you the same page, but this, this time I'm showing you with a menu where you could select your language of preference. As you could see, I have on the right hand, I have put the different language we have and the individual right on the main page could change again um, to the language of preference. Next. Now this is the page that the individuals will see if they will go to that section, this is our main page for the advanced child tax credit payments in 2021. Now, I am illustrating with the arrows the different online tools we have available to assist taxpayers. And I'm going to go over these briefly in the further um, slides. But I want to show you what you would see in that main page. And again, it's if you want this page in specific language, you have the opportunity to do that. In this same page at the bottom, there's a section called other information. And a lot of the information that I have on the right hand side is available within that section. A lot of our partners, community based organization, all of those stakeholders that are assisting us with this message, um, they go and visit this section because we have a lot of information that they could use to post on the website, to provide in newsletters. So, on the right hand side, you have a lot of the information we have um, in that particular page. Um, next. One of the very important section within actually that other information is a FAQ. So in that previous page that I show you, at the bottom, you could link to our frequently um, asked question. This is extremely important because we know our telephone lines are extremely busy. And many times questions that taxpayers might have, the answers might be in the in this particular section. We have created these frequently asked questions in a way we have categorized them to try to make them easy for taxpayers when they have a question. So I'm just giving you an idea, a screenshot, so you could see how these um, particular question has been structured or created. Um, in the event ever someone asks you a question, uh, you might direct them to this particular page. Uh, next. I want to show you, this is an example of what a particular question might be. And this question has been asked by individuals sometimes at the presentation. And this is how to report a missing payment. Well, an individual might know already that they were entitled. There's a particular online tool that can let the individuals know how, how the payments the IRS has been making to them. So what happens if the individuals did not get their payment? What happens if the individual, the 2020 bank account information they had is no longer open under change? So it's possible maybe a check that was sent, also the taxpayer did not receive it. So this allows an explanation for the individuals to know how many days they have to wait 
before requesting from the IRS a tracing of the payment and what they have to do. So this is how our FAQs are structured. Next. So what is the um, portal, this child tax credit update portal? It allows individuals to view the payments the IRS have been making to them in, and by also allowing them to see that they're eligible. It allows them to enroll from payments. There's some individuals that might not want to get this payment and they might want to wait until they file the tax return and receive that big amount. We know that sometimes individuals like a lot of withholding from the salary and they see it as a savings. So when they file the re uh, return, they get a big uh, refund. Well, some individuals also might want to, not interested in receiving that, and they could enroll. Also, it's possible, like I mentioned before, someone might not have that dependent anymore, and they need to enroll. Um, Another thing, it says here, um, make changes to your bank account. And this was um, scheduled for August. I'm very happy that this is already functional. The individuals could go to the portal and update bank information. Next. Also, this is what's coming in the future. Individuals can make changes up to their income. It's possible last year someone in their 2020 might have been a higher income in which they did not receive the child tax credit, but due to maybe layoff, losing jobs, or reduction in hours, maybe this individual would qualify for the child tax credit. So they may, could make that update to inform the IRS of this change in income. Also, there's changes in taxpayers' marital status. They could make that change on the portal. And these are changes, again, that are coming in the near future. Also, adding children or reducing children because of birth um, and other factors that the IRS will determine a functionality. So this, we look forward that this feature would soon be updated to allow taxpayers to make those changes. Next. Now, we have individuals that are non filer non-filers and they don't have a filing requirement. Um, we always encourage individuals, even if they don't have a filing requirement, it is possible depending what type of income they have that they might qualify for other credits, for example, like the earned income credit. So for someone to benefit from that credit, they would have to file. So even though sometimes taxpayers do not have a filing requirement, it's to their advantage to file, to obtain certain credits. But for those individuals that have no filing requirements, are not planning on filing, the IRS doesn't have information on that. So we have the tool that is called the non-filer for individuals to enter basic information about themselves and their children to be able for the IRS to know and compute the child tax credit that they will be entitled and to provide them with the advance payment. One important feature about this particular tool is there's still individuals out there that never received the economic impact payment that maybe we're not aware, or again, um, because they're a non-filer, maybe they even thought that they did not qualify for that amount. So with this particular tool, not only these non-filer will be able to register to receive the advance payment of child tax credit, but also if they did not get the um, EIP, the economic impact payment, they will also, as they sign here, that would allow, this tool would allow them also to obtain uh, those payments. Jean? And this, to give you an idea how much potential payment is out there for non-filers, this shows how much we're speaking. For example, the, the, the column is showing, this is including the advanced child tax payments and also EIP. And again, we are looking at, a, at a, one adult, the, the second column, one adult and one child over five. So they would receive a total of 7,200, 7,200. If we're looking at a couple, a married couple filing together, two adults, one child over five, we're looking at a total payment of 10,400. And if we're looking at two adults with two children over five, we're looking at 14,400. This is the amount of potential payment that a non-filer um, 
would be entitled to. Again, using that particular portal to register so the IRS could make the calculation. Next. All these individuals, the non-filer needs to enter is full name, current mailing address, an email address, date of birth, valid social security number or items for the taxpayers, and social, and social security for the dependent, and a bank account if they have one. Now, I'm not sure if um, when we were issuing the economic impact payment, we had a similar tool. Um, just the only difference was that tool was meant for the individuals at the time the IRS was issuing the economic impact payment. So there's been taxpayers already that have used this tool. Again, it's for because there are non-filers. Next. This is a publication. It's one of the attachments um, that one of the information that you will have available as a handout is the publication 5538 and it's a guide for the non-filer, the individuals that might be using this tool. And it's an excellent resource because it has screenshot. It gives the individuals a heads up as to what to look so they could familiarize into what information they're gonna need and how it's gonna look. So it gives them that sense that is not that difficult, but it, it, again, it allows them to, to, to prepare for the information and how it's going to look. Uh, next. The advanced child tax credit, uh, this is another tool, eligibility assistant, is another tool that we have available. Most likely this might be uh, used by an individual that are not getting the advance payment, and maybe they're looking at to know whether they are uh, eligible. Uh, to receive that. So it's a, just an online tool asking very uh, simple questions and helping the taxpayer determine if they are eligible for these payments. Next. Now we're getting ready to the end, but I always, um, and, and the IRS is always trying to communicate to taxpayer to be aware of scams. We know when there's a disaster. We know when there's certain payments may be being issued um, to taxpayers from the IRS. There's a lot of scam artists out there. And unfortunately, they prey on the elderly. They prey on individuals that maybe English is not the first language. Newcomers that might not know how the government works, how the IRS works. And, and because of the need, sometimes a situation that maybe individuals are um, in terms of economic. Uh, but we always want to inform the taxpayer the IRS never contacts individuals requesting personal information, whether it's an email, forms of text, or by telephone. I always mention to the, we, we're so courteous sometimes that we entertain even when someone uh, calls and, and unfortunately, they're so good and trying to convince that unfortunately a lot of folks fall victims of them. I always say to the individuals, as soon as you hear someone says the IRS and they're trying to get information, just hang up. We cannot allow them that even one minute uh, because what they're trying to do is obtain your personal information. Again, the IRS will never, and we have seen already individuals um, letting us know, yes, they're getting texts asking for information about the child tax credit and things like that. So know that the only official go to irs.gov for information, the official information, and never answer these emails, telephone calls, or texts uh, providing information. Um, I think that I have one more slide is my contact information. Again, our organization assists um, with presentation, outreach, and we have been working a lot even with the homeless community, different organizations, trying to see how we could work, how we could assist them, get the word out about these payments. So if I could be of assistance to anyone in the future, you have my telephone number here. Thank you so much, Jean, and again, to the Greater Haitian American Chamber for allowing me to share this information. That was awesome. That was, a, and I apologize for the background noise. I've got a toddler who uh, doesn't seem to have any manners this morning. But um, Manisa, that was fantastic. That was a lot of information. And I um, I know for me, there was a bunch of things that I saw that I was like, okay, this is good, this is good. But I wanna give some opportunity to um, to, to, the, to the audience here. 
Um, if anybody has any questions, because um, it, it was a lot of information, um, please be sure, you know, you can unmute yourself or you can put your question um, in the chat uh, and, 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 and ask directly. Um, I know I want to start off with one. I saw that you guys have a lot of different resources for being able to get information. And one of the things I saw was that you had YouTube links. Um, is it something to where people can, you know, actually watch like examples to see, you know, how to fill things out or where to get questions and things like that? Like, is that what, is that what's on there? Yes, we have uh, different videos um, pertaining the advanced child tax credit, and I'll be more than happy, Jean, to provide you with some of those links. And we have created that particular um, publication that I mentioned because a lot of our partners also sometimes are requesting what could we provide to assist um, the community. So definitely, I will look for those um, videos and share them um, so you could uh, also post them to assist the public. Okay. Yeah, that, that, that'll be awesome. And thank you for providing your email address and, and phone number. Um, I, I hope that we, 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 <laughs> we inundate you with, with really good questions. And um, for those of us that are out there that, you know, are looking for more of me, have questions or maybe just know somebody else, because um, I'm sure that we all, you know, have someone who, who, who may have questions about this, um, that they can reach out to you. Thank you so much. My question, I just realized I didn't have my video. I am so sorry. Uh, maybe when I was trying to share, it went off. So I apologize no. for not having that. No, totally fine. Totally fine. I think you're good there. You're good. Thank you for being there. And be, uh, by all means, you know, hang out. Um, uh, you know, throughout the rest of the the panel. Yeah. Um, if, if anything, you may be dr brought into it uh, with with the rest of the panel members to answer some questions. Um, as we get into it. But um, yeah, thank you so much for that. All right. So I want to give another second here. Um, does anybody have anybody have any questions? Um, Marissa, I, I do. Um, just a quick question. I know at one point there was a um, when there was a deadline for the EIP. And um, excuse me if I'm misstating this, but I know there was a, a roughly or roughly around 12 million people who didn't get an opportunity to apply before that deadline at a particular time. Um, has that been extended? And if so, um, what are some of the efforts you guys are, are, are doing to, to uh, get those folks who may not necessarily uh, have access to online resources and stuff like that to get their, um, get access to those funds? Sure, great, great question. When we were having, when we were issuing the economic impact payment, uh, we were trying at one particular, uh, within the October date, on, on one occasion, it was because of the online tool that would allow the individuals to, to be able to register. When that date was coming very close, then the other alternative was to file a return. So that's why during certain months, we were trying to get the word out just like the child tax credit. And thank you for mentioning that because this, this tool that we have the online, again, uh, for non-filers, um, as of now, on um, this, they will be able to use it until October 15. So thank you for mentioning that. And, and we will try to be doing a lot of outreach to try for these folks, again, to be able to get these payment to register because otherwise then what's going to happen, they're going to have to wait maybe until the filing date. They're, then they'll lose that opportunity. Still there's a payment for November, still there's a payment for December. Now, what have we done? Um, we've tried to work because you are correct. There's a lot of folks that again, might not have known that they were entitled for like the homeless community. So we were reaching out to um, a di different community-based organizations where we're attention when we were having our initial um, discussion or introduction, how much we're working also with the school district. We are nationwide reaching out to all school mm -hmm. districts to share information to see if somehow through them that information is shared. Um, so we are trying at all possible um, partner with different um, organizations in, in getting the word out. So thanks for uh, asking that question. Perfect, thank you. My pleasure. Awesome.
What other questions do we have? Any other questions, anybody? Okay. All right. I think that's it for there. All right. Thank you so much, Mesa. Again, really appreciate that presentation. And I'm sure we'll be in touch with you um, over the next coming days and, and possibly weeks. But thank you for that. That was a lot. Awesome. My pleasure. All right. So I'll stay here just oh. in case a question comes up, I'll stay here. Yeah, yeah, please do. Yeah, please hang around. And then um, uh, uh, we'll, yeah, we'll, 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 we'll reference you. We'll bring you right back in, you know, as, as we have those come up. Okay. So we're going to get into our, uh, our, 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 our meat and potatoes here with our panel. Um, again, we have Trey, we have Rose, uh, we have Socrates, and then, of course, we have Maritza as well. Um, so uh, I have a couple of questions that were pre-submitted. Um, we also have um, some questions that we have for a poll. And um, Socrates, is it okay that I go ahead and post those now? Nope, you're on Let's me. go ahead and do that. Uh, as we start the panel discussion, I kind of want to understand who we have on the call with us so we can kind of customize our responses, if you will, targeting some of the um, responses from the poll. So I'll kind of read it off to you to understand where we're coming from. The first question is on a scale of one to 10, how passionate or happy are you about your current industry or job that you're in right now? So if you're extremely happy, eight to 10, if you're moderately happy, five to seven, somewhat happy and then of course if you're not happy you can zero to two uh, and answer the second question it's if your business grew by 10 percent i'm sorry 10, 10x uh 10x um not 10 percent, but 10x uh do you feel that you have the business acumen and leadership skills to effectively lead that scale of an operation so if your business grew 10 times uh, uh, do you have the acumen and business skills to actually handle or manage that size of the operation? And then last but not least, as a professional, do you have the leadership growth, uh, growth plan for yourself and for your team members as a professional? Do you have a growth plan? If the answer is yes, somewhat no. And what is a growth plan? So if you can answer these three questions for me, I think it'll help me kind of customize what I focus on as I address um, some of the questions during the panel discussion. Good, very good. All right, so I'm gonna give a second or two to let people continue to do that while I pull up um, uh, some questions that I yeah. have for you all. And then Gene, also once the results are in, I know with the poll with, um, with Zoom, we can kind of see how the folks responded as a as a normal poll. I kind of want to want everyone on the, on the call to see mm -hmm. the overall responses from from folks. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. We yeah, once, well, once we once we do that, we'll end it and, and it should be able to publish it so everybody can see it. Perfect. Well. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Mm -hmm. So we'll give we'll give it a second here. Um, all right. So while I everybody continue to engage in that. Um, oh wait, I think I got a question for. Um, for Marita's contact information. So I'll put that in there. I can write it now. You got Thank it, you. yeah. Go ahead and put that in the chat. We have somebody who's asking for your, your contact info. I uh, will do it right away. Uh, fantastic, thank you, thank you. Okay, so in light of 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 technology so um this 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 one i think is, is is a good one to kind of get kicked off with um uh being that we have to pivot uh a lot of our communications and parts of our business to online um what are some tech not some what are some technology concerns that we should be aware of um and also what are some things that we should know to keep our information and our customers or client information safe Is that a question for the panel? For you guys on the panel, yeah. Anyone who wants to take that. I, I, yeah. I can start. Um, uh, I am. I used to be technical years ago. I'm not so technical anymore. But so what I would advise small business owners to do, or individuals in particular, is to reach out to experts. For example, on this call, we have uh, PJ, who is my IT uh, person. We had a couple of uh, instances in our business where 
we've lost laptops or laptops have crashed or we've lost uh, an employee voluntarily or involuntarily, I think it's important that you have backup. Uh, we hired, for example, PJ to do manage network service for us, uh, which allows us to back up our data. So if we terminate an employee, we can still access the information and that employee will no longer have access to it. So those are the things that for me as a business owner, I'm always thinking about how do I mitigate against um, lost theft or information uh, uh, that are proprietary information to me. And so the, the best thing that we've come up with is not try to be all things to all people. I think a lot of business owners want to do everything, right? If you're whatever industry you're in, they, they want to be a technical person. They want to be a marketer, but sometimes it's best to outsource that resource. And in our case, we hired PJ, who is a little plug for PJ, but is in, he's a phenomenal IT person that is uh, essentially uh, an extension or a member of my team. So for me as a business owner, it's always good to outsource some resources and services that you're not an expert in to allow you to protect your proprietary information. Yeah, that's good. Rose, I'm going to repeat the question for you. I think that yeah, you thank asked you. about it. Yep. So uh, being that we've had to pivot uh, a lot of our communications and parts of our businesses online, uh, what are some technology concerns that uh, we should be aware of um, on keeping our information safe? Um, first is uh, cybersecurity, cybersecurity attacks. Um, I think a lot of times when we hear about cybersecurity attacks, we're hearing it from the big corporations. And we don't realize that as many times as we hear these corporations being attacked, it's maybe, you know, 100 times for smaller businesses. And so there are um, some uh, guidelines and tools that are available that you can implement um, yourself. It's not uh, um, it's not. It's something that every uh, uh, every business owner can implement. Things like password protection, using a password protection tool. Um, we use uh, OnePass uh, for our, our organization. Um, there's uh, other different ones that are available. They're very affordable. And what they do is they protect your password. Uh, one of the things is instead of using a, a password that you use all the time for all of your logins, it will generate uh, uh, unique passwords that you don't have to remember. Um, and and uh, it's going to be very hard to um, uh, break. Um, things like protecting yourself when you uh, access websites, mm -hmm. um, having a, a security um, program on your computer and not the one that came with the computer that was free for two months, having an actual robust security program. Um, uh, so there's different things um, that you can do that you can actually implement yourself um, and they're available online if uh, sometimes you don't know what you don't know. Um, and, and sometimes and it's best as you, if you want to reach out to I know Black Orlando Tech, you can reach out to us and we'll we've uh, we'll provide a list of that information um, uh, for you to go and look over and kind of see what's best for your business. Um, and then there's also different levels. And, you know, for uh, those who are business owners who maybe it's just them in the company, you know, maybe their funds don't allow to hire someone. You can there's some smaller uh, things that you can implement now. But the the goal is to always to improve because your, your business is going to grow. Mm -hmm. And so you're going to you know, that um Password protector that's four ninety nine a month is not going to always work for your business, especially when you scale up and you start having um, employees and stuff. So always have in the back of your mind that you're always going to sell scale up. So you may do it yourself now, but um, definitely plan as your business grows to then outsource like Socrates was um, uh, speaking about down the line. Yeah. That's really good. Thank you, Rose, for that mm -hmm. as well. Socrates, thank you for that. And, and especially, you know, bringing on, an, you know, another member that's here, you know, with the chamber and how how they're helping uh, mm -hmm. and what they're doing, you know, specifically. Um, mm -hmm. I had kind of had a follow question for, for you as well, Rose. It's like the I know that some business owners, when they think about their 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 technology or their their, their devices and, you know, their mm -hmm. and things like that, or even whether they're distributed or whether they're, you know, uh, in an office, you know, especially if you're getting started up, you don't really know how much to spend on something. Cause it, yes. you know, when it comes to like, you're, you're buying computers, you're buying phones, you're getting data, you know, you're doing all this other stuff, yeah. you know, do you have like, 
I know that you said that there's, you know, some things that you kind of get with the beginning, but do you have any advice about how to really understand what's really working for you? Or is it really better to say, hey, let me just focus on my business because that's what I know, and then bring in somebody else to, to really do an assessment and then be able to manage that because you don't want to, I would imagine you would want a relationship because it sounds like Socrates has a relationship with PJ, right? So is that better to do in your opinion? Yeah. So it all depends on the business and the business owner and where they're comfortable at. Um, for me, I'm biased in this uh, with this question because I have a uh, extensive tech background. I could do those things myself, and so it doesn't behoove me to hire someone. But if tech is not your is not something that is your wheelhouse and you don't even want to bother with it, definitely um, uh, go out and hire someone else to kind of, um, um, you know, implement or identify what you need and, and give you that, that, um, that, that consultation. Um, so it's always go by what you are comfortable with. Um, there are certain things that, you know, HR, I'm not, that's not my wheelhouse. That's not something I want to even tackle. Legal, that's not my wheelhouse. So as you go and you identify these different uh, parts of your business, you have to identify, okay, do I want to, you know, I, I, the way I do it is I, I, I know how much I make an hour. And then I said, okay, how much time is it going to take me to learn this? Because it's not my wheelhouse and then implement it. And it doesn't make sense. Or can I go and pay someone for it? And then spend my time uh, on revenue producing activities. That's how I gauge. So um, that's what I'll say is go, go based on your gut. If you are very familiar with tech, you're comfortable and say you just need guidance, tap into, I, 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 I'm going to plug Black Orlando Tech because we love okay. to help people. And it's not something that we go and, you know, we're charging for. You can go into our group and ask simple questions like, Hey, I'm running these type of software. What type of computer um, spec should I be looking for? And you'll have a ton of people coming in and giving you that information. But if tech is not your thing, I, I don't don't even give yourself the headache and and go and and, and look for um, a vendor that can assist you with that. Makes sense. Makes sense. Can I take you back yeah, on that real quickly? Oh. oh. My, my apologies. Uh, I, I'm, I'm my, sorry. My, my apologies, Socrates. Right. I was going to just hop in there um, because I, I really want to try to scare everybody straight, um, if you will, because ransomware is real. It is. Uh, fraud and identity theft is real. And for all my small business families out there, please just take the time. If, if you don't have a tech background, uh, take the time to tap into these resources that um, my fellow panelists uh, have have um, explained to you all. Because on the banking side of things, being it's a pain mm. for you to have to really work through and sort all of those things out when your small business and your personal information has been compromised, um, and it can set you back more so than it puts you in a position to take you forward. So um, please just take that opportunity to, to do that um, because, um, yeah, as I stated earlier, that stuff is, is definitely real. We are definitely in unprecedented times. Like Marissa um, explained a little bit earlier, it's not just the elderly they're preying on. What they're preying on is the needs of uh, small businesses also that are um, in desperate need of help. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they know that you need access to capital. They know that you need those things. So, and they have um, just that when I'm, like, Rose is an expert. PJ is an expert as well. There are people out there that have malicious intentions that are just as smart as they are. And, and, and they, you know, for whatever reason, want to, um, you know, take advantage of folks. So just keep that stuff in mind. So, um, definitely take heed to the advice so it won't come back to bite you. Mm -hmm. And um, my apologies, Socrates. No, it's okay. I was going to piggyback on what Rose said. She's so, she's so correct on that. But I will also add, even if you are an expert or you, you're pretty techno technologically savvy, sometimes it doesn't make sense for you to spend numerous hours doing something that you can hire someone and pay them a fraction of the cost, right? It's an opportunity cost. So, for example, if you you know if you're a three hundred dollar an hour person, 
you're not going to spend five hours dealing with your uh, IT room when you can hire someone and pay them a fraction of that cost, even if you know what you're doing, right? And so I think it's two things. It's first, you have to make, you know, touch it if you know what you're doing. But secondly, ask yourself, can my time be utilized elsewhere in the organization as that, at that opportunity cost? Because I find a lot of small businesses are unable to grow because the owners are doing everything because they, they think they're, you know, jack of all trades. And sometimes they are, but then the business is not growing because instead of, you know, hiring an assistant to answer the phone, they want to answer the phone because they know best. Instead of going out and getting new business, they're, they're in the comm closet messing with the with the uh, I, you know with the IT and the phone system and things of that nature. So that I, again, I want to piggyback on what Rose said. It is so important for us to think about that as business owners when we think about growth. That can stumble or, or, or stunt someone's growth in business when you have to, your hands in too many things, particularly IT stuff that can be complicated at times. Mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap up because I want to come back to the poll in a second here, but I just wanted to piggyback on that. I've, I've actually seen that where, where some businesses, you know, in their minds, they're thinking they're saving money by trying to do a lot of the things. They're trying to do marketing. They're trying to do, uh, uh, you know, digital. They're trying to do all these other things. And it's like, you can't do it all. And, you know, so that's a really good point, Socrates. Thank you for that. Cool. Very good. Okay, so let me take a quick second here. I want to go ahead and showcase uh, the poll. And uh, here we go. So I think I can share the results here. All right. So they should be up on the screen now. That is really, really uh, 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 interesting poll. The first one was, you know, how satisfied are you with your current industry or job? I read a Wall Street article recently, and this is totally the opposite of what we're seeing here, that 85% of Americans are not necessarily happy with their job or industry. You got to ask yourself, why are people working in industries or jobs that they're not happy with? And so I wanted to find out, you know, how who do we have in the audience and your level of satisfaction. It looks like most of the folks here have selected, you know, eight to 10. They're very happy with their job, which I think is important. That means you may have found your passion. Uh, so I wrote a little book a couple of years ago. It became a bestseller on Amazon called Find Your Hedgehog and Stop Working. It's about finding your passion. So as the panel continues, I'll talk about those principles. But it's important that you ask yourself, for those of you who selected uh, uh, moderate or somewhat or not at all, you, you want to constantly ask yourself, what industry am I passionate about or am I passionate in my current role? Because if you're not, life is too short to be some, doing something that you're not passionate about. You can, you can do a ton of things that you're passionate about. Why be stuck in a job that you're not passionate about? And sometimes we may be passionate about an industry, but may not be passionate about the job. And you got to think about those things as well. So I can answer questions about that. But the second question is this. If your business grew 10x over a year or in a year or two, would you be ready to handle that? And, and the response we got here is 56% of you said you somewhat will be ready. And only 17% said you are. And some said, you know, they're not sure or no. And, and I think that's pretty uh, um, standard responses. The challenge that I have for you, and I want to share a quick story with you so you understand where I'm coming from. In 2012, my business did $500,000. In less than two years, we went from $500,000 to uh, $4 million. Now, uh, that's that's sharing that is, is important because if we weren't preparing ourselves years prior by educating ourselves and putting the right structure in place, we would never be ready to handle a business that grew exponentially. So if you are a small business owner or just you work for someone and you're looking to get become a business owner one day, ask yourself, am I ready for that promotion or two, two promotions above where I'm at right now? And what can I do to be prepared if my responsibility, even if you're not a business owner, if your responsibility grew 10x, for example, if you're managing 10 people now and you're now managing a, a, a thousand, uh, a group of a thousand people or 10 or 100 people, would you be ready to expand to handle that or would that team be managing you? And if the answer is not, 
emphatically yes, then there's work for all of us to do. And so I'm always promoting folks to continue education and growth because at the end of the day, if you're not ready for your growth, then you may not be able to handle that if the business even came your way. Mm -hmm. So I think that's something that I, I touch on and I wanted to stress re relating to this poll. And the last question and is- Before you before you go there, hold one second. Sure, sure, I had sure. a comment that uh, Manisa wanted to chime in on. So Manisa, come on in for just for, before we go too far. So, so, so sorry, but uh, I just wanted to add two things and I was so sure, happy. Sure, absolutely. So I, I, I was so excited in hearing this conversation, especially when we're talking about identity, th identity theft and things like that. As I mentioned, I work a lot with the business community. So that is extremely important. But I wanted to also make a point that how important it is also that we look at our internal, um, internal threats in terms of our employees, because many times we protect the outside thinking the intrusion is coming from within outside, mm -hmm. but we have threat inside. If we allow sometimes our personnel to have access to everything. So I always say it's very important if certain employees will have access to certain personal information that they be those. There's no reason for all of the employees to have uh, information mm -hmm. about everything. Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention, because we've seen this in, in big corporation, um, university, when there's been a W-2 um, information stolen just because someone pretended to be a CEO of that company and just asked someone send an email making believe it was the C CEO and their employee just released the information. Um, so have controls to um, how something like that would be prevented. Um, would, would an employee question the person asking for that information. So mm -hmm. just wanted to add those two things. Yeah, yeah. No, good points. Very good points there. Thank you. Okay, Sakuji, right back to you. No, uh, I'll echo what Marissa just said. In 2014, I fired my uh, bookkeeper because the threat was internal, if you if you get my drift. Yeah. Uh, my bookkeeper had some uh, fraud issues that caused her to lose her uh, job with us. So to your point, Maritza, a lot of the times the threats are within. Something that we recently went through that helps protect threats, for example, is um, we we had employees use their own laptops. And so if someone left, term, uh, was terminated voluntarily or involuntarily, they would have all access to my information uh, if they made a decision to leave the company. So what we've decided to do is we issue our own laptops and, and uh, computers to our employees. So if they have to leave for whatever reason, we can quickly, uh, you know, uh, take control of that asset and not have uh, proprietary information and customer information, uh, sensitive information floating out there in, 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 in the hands of our former employees. But I think to your point, Maritza, Many times the threats are within, we have to protect just as much from within as we do with uh, exterior th threats as well. Mm -hmm. Yep, very good, very good. I, I, this is Rose, I wanted to add something. Yeah. Um, and then I don't know if we're gonna talk about it uh, down the line, but um, the conversation right now in regards to threats and um, you know internal and external um, kind of connects to something that's very important, which is, uh, setting up uh, uh, business processes and automations and things like that. So that way you can check, you know, um, I know, you know, when we think about it personal, um, I know I, um, there would be times I would go um, and months without checking um, a credit card uh, or a bank account because I'm so busy and I have everything on auto pay. But what I realized is that's not something that's, you know, that's not good to do. And with so many accounts, I had to set up a, a process that I can go and do a quick, um, uh, again, my background's data analytics, you know, uh, business intelligence. So I set up a process so where I can do quick checks mm -hmm. and that something like that is also needed for your business to where you can go and check over things and, and uh, be able to quickly identify, set up alerts, uh, be able to quickly identify any activities that are not in line with your business process. So look into uh, things like that. So that way, you know, you're not blindsided by, um, 
theft or any any anything else, um, mispayment. I mean, it's it's a it's different things that um, that could uh, impact your business negatively. Um, set up those processes and set up those automations so that way you, the busy person, especially if you don't, you know, maybe you don't have an assistant who can help. Um, you're able to catch those things now or maybe within a few days versus down the road when you can your you know your um, uh, reaction it has a less of an impact to, to um, fix that. So business processes and automation are very important. As you say that, I'm, I'm going to go and check my account because I haven't checked it in probably <laughs> about a week and a half. So thank you for saying that. <laughs> You're absolutely right. <laughs> but yeah, Gene, like, uh, you know, that was a, a um, uh, client of mine that lost $25,000 by, you know, um, they tapped into a website and and they get ended up getting access to their checking account information. And there were auto drafts that was coming out of the account. Um, and for the entire year, he was not paying attention to that. And so what a lot of people don't realize is that um, there are, um, if you don't dispute those transactions within a certain period of time, then there's a loss. So, um, so Rose is absolutely right. Um, you know, you work hard for your money. You definitely want to be able to protect those assets. Um, really, really pay attention to that. So, Very good. Very good. All right. Let me pivot back to you, Socrates, because you had a third question in there in the poll. And I'm sure. Just to go over that. Sure. The third question was, as a professional, do you have a, a leadership growth plan in place for you and your team? And uh, many folks said, uh, 39% said yes. Some said somewhat. And, and yet some said no. Rather than sharing what we can advise that we all do, I'd like to see if members of the audience can kind of share with us, particularly those that have said yes, what are some of the things that you're doing to grow yourself from a leadership perspective? Because at the end of the day, the second question that I did ask, if your business grew exponentially, would you be able to handle that, the scale? It, it ultimately falls on you as a leader to kind of prepare for growth, right? So I'm curious to know, what are the, some, some of the things that you all are doing? And I'll share some things that have worked for me as our business has grown from, you know, uh, um, less than a million to multiple million dollars in business and multiple locations. Uh, I'll share some of those things. But what, what are some of the things that you all are doing that you find to be helpful in terms of your leadership growth? Uh, so, uh, Socrates, yes, actually, sir. Be, before I answer that, I have a couple of questions I get that might help. Sure. Uh, if you can touch base on, for example, myself, I can attest to that. Uh, earlier on, starting a business as a one-person uh, shop, if you will, uh -huh. I believe many small businesses run into this issue. How and when do you hire? And hiring the right person for the right position sure. that will enable you to be able to go after the business and yet be able to manage. Can you touch on that a little bit as far as strategies that a small business may or markers they may they may use to say hey, uh, you that one person but yet you know you want to be able to follow that so you're not just operating that hobby and be able to scale up absolutely so uh in 2010 when i opened my office in orlando the first year we barely did a hundred thousand dollars i remember the first month in business we did eighty dollars that was eighty dollars not eight hundred but eighty dollars Meanwhile, my expenses for the month, Rose is laughing, but my expenses was like $8,000, right? So I made 80 bucks the first month and I, my expense was $8,000. So I had to dig myself out of a hole. So I, I hired a young lady who was kind of, uh, well, I'll take a step back. What I found to be helpful for me is as I was out there marketing, trying to get business, when I did get a few clients, when they would call me, I would be out of the office. So I, wouldn't, I wasn't able to service my clients. So I, I made another investment in my business by hiring someone so that I can at least handle the clients that I had. But I had to do uh, the, the opportunity cost. Okay, well, what's the cost of me you know, staying in the office, answering the phone and ha handling the few clients that I had? Or did it make more sense for me to go out and get more clients? So I think after month three or so, I hired an assistant. And that helped me out a lot. But now looking back, I probably would have done it differently. I could have hired a virtual assistant, which would have been easier in terms of cost. But for me, it was all about always about what's the best use of my time. You know, in real estate, for example, uh, some of you may be familiar with real estate. I'll use a real estate term, which I think will, will make sense. 
it's highest and best use. I don't know if you all are familiar with that, that term, highest and best use. My highest and best use was not at the office answering the call when it came in. My highest and best use was going out there and growing my business. And we did that and I continued to grow. And so I think you, everyone is different, right? Um, uh, everyone is different in terms of their talents. So you have to ask yourself, what is the highest and best use for me as, as a business owner? And can I hire someone to do it for me at a lesser cost? I, I try not to do too many things that I can have someone else do for me where I can focus on someone, something more uh, on a larger macro scale for the business, particularly when it comes to marketing and growing the business. I try to focus on being the rainmaker, if you will. All right. Does anybody have uh, a growth plan that they have that they've that they've got in place that they want that would love to share? You no. Know, also, what what are some of the things that you are doing to grow as a as part of your growth plan? Mm -hmm. uh, I'll chime in on that. I know for sure. us, uh, I'm in the therapy uh, industry, uh, healthcare industry, uh, as a small uh, practice. We call it one of the issues we we face. Uh, we talk about is cross training, so that way. Uh, you able to you wear multiple hats, but at the same time, hopefully we can promote within. But at the same time, too, to the point that uh, Socrates made earlier, is learning to leverage those resources to see I may not be the best person for that role. Uh, so invest in that uh, invest in that role in that position. Get that person because they're producing will match or leverage. The, the, the company's uh, growth, if, if you will, rather than me spending the time trying to do it because I'm not the expert at it. So that's, that's one of the, uh, the key issues I think that small business uh, we struggle with, uh, learning to give control, uh, take control away from you, from you as the owner, uh, the manager, and let someone else who's an expert take the lead and, 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 lead, and, and lead that. But then you spend less time managing that individual because they are the expert and they're able to conduct the business for you. I think there's ways to um, un, uh, to ensure that um, the person that you bring in are running or doing their tasks um, in the way that your business needs it to be, uh, which is one of the things that um, uh, entrepreneurs um, have issues with, which is they have their, when you're running your business, um, you as the CEO know how to run your business. But majority of the time, everything is up here. And a lot of us do not take what's up here and put it on paper and put it in a way that someone can come in, have, especially if they have that experience. Yeah, they're going to have that experience in HR. They're going to have the experience in accounting, but they're not, they need that experience to understand or um, knowledge to know how to um, apply those um that expertise to your business. And so one of the things is we need to go and take what's up here and put it on paper and put it in processes and procedures. So that way, those who we bring in are going to go and have something to follow. I think that's the, that's the, the, the blocker because it takes time, um, but it's needed. So that way, when you bring someone in, you know, they're not coming in and not, and you, now have to take time to train the person because you have no documentation to even provide them and 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 no one else can tell them what to do so i think that's one of the biggest things that um uh, entrepreneurs and small business owners need to do they need to document how to run their business you can i chime in oh oh um, sorry no, no, it's okay. Really quick question for a follow up for you, Rose, um, because that's definitely right at me. I think you're talking to me. I feel like I'm a church. <laughs> so that was a good question. The um, one of the one of the inhibitors for me, and uh, I, I'm not going to speak for everybody here, but one of the inhibitors for me when it comes to documenting my process, because I have it all up here mm -hmm. in my mind, I'm like, I can get this done so much quicker than trying to write down step by step by step by step. Mm -hmm. So my question to you is, what's a good way to start that documenting process? Is it like, is it, is it beneficial to do it? You know, like, should I find like some kind of template that's out there to do that? Or is it just, you know, just I, a word document and just, you know, typing it out and then maybe going back and editing it, you know, as I, as I need to, like, you know, how, 
uh, I guess, formal does it need to be or does it not need to be just for the sake of, OK, at least we have something to start. on? Yeah, I'll tell you what we did uh, for for Black Orlando Tech. And I'll tell you what I did for my business. Um, Black Orlando Tech, we hired a nonprofit uh, consultant. And we had three two-hour sessions where I like gave her everything, recorded it, and then she, again, expert, took that and created the procedures and the documentation because she had that experience with nonprofits, with what we needed, what need what needed to be put in there, and that's why I did that because I didn't have the time. Uh, I could sit there and talk. Uh, but I didn't have the time to write down stuff. I did the same thing for my business. Hired a uh, person who was had ex- uh, expertise in creating procedures and processes. Um, spoke to them. How you know how many of our sessions? Three sessions. How many of our hours each? Gave them all the information, and they drafted up the documentation that I needed. All of them. You know, uh, intern new hire, um, HR, all of the stuff. And then I went through and I reviewed it and, and it was done. That's, you know, um, Socrates was talking about that, that opportunity cost. That is where I identify the opportunity cost because I did not want to sit down and have to write this out. I knew how to articulate it, but writing it out was a whole nother different thing. And I gave that to the expert. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I think Socrates, did you have a, a comment on that? Sure. Um, um, question for the, the audience and the panel. What is the difference between a, an owner operator and a true business owner? And, and I'm, I'm, I, I want to touch on what Rose just said, but I'm curious to know if anyone would share with, with the, the group, what is the difference be, between an owner operator and a business owner, a true business owner? It's an opinion. There's no right or wrong. Just curious. Anybody? So, if I if, right. if I may, uh, this is Jacob. I just want to touch back on the point that you guys uh, talked about earlier on, as far as the growth plan. Mm-hmm. Something I think that's a little bit more important than just having a growth plan is having a personal growth plan. Oh, absolutely. From a leadership standpoint, you have to have a plan to develop yourself in terms of communication, ability to influence, uh, and so on and so forth. A lot of times we have leaders in place or in position, but just don't have that leadership skills to continue to grow that business. Absolutely. So I think that's crucial that as we grow a business, that we have a personal and in, uh, individual developmental plan that we're working on mm-hmm. to improve yourself as a leader. So as you move forward, as you grow your business, you as a leader also are growing in terms of your level of competency your knowledge and so on and so forth. So I just wanted to throw that out there because I know we're talking about uh, growth. Mm-hmm. Well, growth cannot be, take place without you as an individual growing from a leadership standpoint. Amen. I think to your point that, that the first part of the question is what are you doing to grow personally? And second was what are you doing? What would be a growth plan for your team? But you nailed it. That's exactly where we are going with, the, with, with that question. I think uh, I want to say Tashina answered the question about the difference between um, a biz, an owner operator and a um, business owner. I, I read, I read this and I heard this some time ago, and I want to share it with you. It says that um, you know that you are a business owner or, or a business um, owner operator if you catch a cold and your business catches pneumonia. If you catch a cold, your business catches pneumonia. What it's really saying is that if you're if you are needed so badly that your business cannot survive without you, you are an owner operator. So, and that's okay. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's no right or wrong. But if you want to truly be a business owner, you will do what Rose just said. And that is to document all your processes so that a lot of parts of your business can operate without you being there. So you can be work focused on the business and not in the business. I think a lot of business owners, particularly when you're growing and if you haven't been, if your business is not doing a million dollars yet, when it does, you're going to have another set of problems. And if you are the only person that, the business relies on to survive you are still a business uh, an owner operator and that's okay if that's where you want to be but i think a lot of folks want to be true business owners where the business can survive without them and they can focus on growth i think that's the key difference between an owner operator 
and a true business owner. For example, I'll give an example. For example, if you have a, a, a restaurateur who is a, a great chef and he or she is the best at cooking whatever dish they cook in the, in the kitchen and no one knows how to cook those dishes. They haven't documented, they haven't talked to Rose, so they don't, they don't know about documenting all the recipes. If something happens to him or her, the business will not survive. Would you agree? And that's really a true uh, kind of owner operator. What Rose is saying is what I'm echoing is that if you want to grow beyond where you are, for me, it's about growth. And I, I teach at the university and I focus on how do you grow your business and, 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 and become that business owner. It's really about documenting the things that you do so that you can multiply yourself and focus on perhaps another location, for, for perhaps focus on getting additional clients while your team is focusing in the business, you're focusing on the business. Another thing that you can do, as Rose mentioned, is really that data analytics and looking at your information so you can make sure that you're measuring and monitoring the right performance indicators so that even if you step away and focusing on other growth plan for your business, you can still look to see how your business is performing from a vital signs perspective. Very good. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll also add, if you don't mind, um, that these documentations that our panelists are speaking of, those are live documents, guys. So it's not meant to be completed and then just sitting on your, your bookshelf, that uh, wonderful bookshelf that uh, Socrates has behind him and just collecting dust, you know. So it's, uh, it, it continues to evolve as your business evolves. So just keep that in mind, because when your business grows from $100,000 a year to 500 to a million, and then you're hiring additional employees and you're going back to those policies and procedures you created when you were at $100,000 a year in revenue, that stuff is not going to apply, man. And then it's like, OK, now it's going to end up costing you <laughs> to really work to to, to catch that plan up uh, in, in conjunction to what you initially created. So just keep that in mind. And another way of saying that, uh, many of you may have heard this before, it's called the growth mindset. So it's not just enough to have a growth plan, but it's, it's important to have a growth mindset. And that is when you're constantly thinking about ways you can improve. And if you foster a culture of growth in your environment, when you're not there, your people will still follow suit and do the things that you have set as standards and mm -hmm. so that you have that growth mindset. So growth plan is a good place to start, but the mindset is more important so that you can continue to evolve as your business grows. It's a good point. Uh, that, uh, uh, I believe it was um, Alton. Right. Yeah. So I'm going to I'm going to kind of pivot just a second here, because one of the things that well, one of the major things when when all of us you know, and our businesses have to pay attention to is our bottom line. And so I'm going to pivot to Trey and ask you this question. You mentioned before uh, at the very beginning uh, during your intro about different types of funding opportunities that may or may still be available to small business owners. I think you mentioned the PPP. Um, I think that there may still be um, EIDL options. And then there may be some other options, both locally and things like that, that maybe you and, and other organizations um, around you that offer. So let me kind of address this to you. Like, uh, what are some things that small business owners should be aware of in terms of funding opportunities that uh, they may not know that's still available or may okay. qualify for? Talk to us about that. No, thank you. I think that's a wonderful question. Uh, for those businesses that are out there currently seeking funding, um, as we all know, PPP is no longer available. Um, so, however, there are still funds out there uh, that are uh, pandemic uh, specific, if you will, uh, such as the EIDL. Um, and the wonderful thing about EIDL, especially in terms of being able to leverage funding at a, a very below market rate um, and in an extended term um, is that they have the SBA has made an adjustment in a way where it's really going to be those funds are more targeted than they have ever been before. I know there are uh, just like PPP, you find that um, when they did the autopsy, if you will, there were many underrepresented small businesses who still was not able to get access to funding. Um, now, those are things that there was adjustments that were made during the second tranche of PPP 
that allowed, you know, your independent contractors to be able to optimize um, and maximize um, the amount of funding that they could get. Um, so there was adjustments that was continuously being made throughout that process that has now transitioned into EIDL. Uh, for a lot of folks that don't know, you know, there was um, just the just the, the underwriting criteria that still prohibited a lot of businesses that weren't able to get access to capital to, to do so, to take advantage of those opportunities. And so what they've done was they made that structure a lot more targeted and they've massaged, if you will, the uh, requirements um, so uh, those small businesses can uh, tap into that. So for uh, many folks that don't know, I mean, that the rates that um, that revolves around the EIDL are roughly about 3.75% uh, um, for for-profit for businesses. And for nonprofit businesses, um, it, the rate is lower than that. So if you have not done so, please take that opportunity to apply. My information is in the chat. I can get you guys access to that information as well. So you guys can continue to leverage that opportunity to, to infuse that capital into your business to help you guys continue to be viable and sustainable. Um, in addition to EIDL, um, our offerings as an organization um, we do have through our SOAR program a um, COVID relief type of fund, if you will, that speaks specifically to helping small businesses get access to capital um, that is similar to, um, to EIDL, but it differs in which, well, um, from the payment in terms of patient capital, if you will, it's structured in a way where the, the first 12 months, the payments are going to be interest only. So you can take advantage of the opportunity of having smaller payments. And then after that 12 months, then you, you know, we'll continue to really work with you on, on it um, and engage with you more intimately to make sure that um, your business, um, by the time the, um, the 12 month period um, ends, that you will be in a much stronger position to be able to to uh, be able to pay principal and interest payments on those loans. But uh, before I proceed further, just to give you guys a little bit more insight into um, our organization and what we do, we are a community-based lender um, and a mission-driven lender. We are a nonprofit um, financial institution, a community development financial institution, right? Uh, we don't, um, I, I would like for you guys to think of us in, as, as, as you will, as a, uh, a, a bank that that does not accept deposits. We primarily provide uh, lending and technical assistance and consulting to um, predominantly black and minority owned businesses. And that's what we do. So, um, you know, and jumping, jumping into the funding aspect of it, the need is the need. And wh what I mean by that is really understanding and preparing for um, for you to be able to get access to that capital is more critical than anything. So, you know, um, really understanding what the requirements are for the financial institution that you're seeking funds from and really understanding how you can leverage those dollars in a way where those funds that you acquire is not a burden on your business. So you don't want to work to pay us as a financial institution. You want to work to leverage those funds in a way where, you know, there, there is a return that that is integrated into how your business is functioning that you don't necessarily feel the burden of having to make a loan payment but that is essentially an ally in aiding you in terms of your growth as a small business and so um oftentimes i have conversations with uh, uh, small business owners and they're like oh i don't like debt you know i'm not i'm debt averse and you want to bootstrap everything you want to self-fund everything because you fully don't understand how to leverage those dollars and, and really truly utilize the, the funds that you're borrowing as an, as an investment instrument rather than a debt uh, burden. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the things that you want to keep in mind. I have um, a follow up question for 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 um for all of you if if you want to Trey if you want to uh, tee this one off or, or or anyone else but when it when it comes to because you you mentioned something Trey that was really important right where it's like you don't want to take on a financial burden 
And then it ends up being that ends up being the focus of your business instead of like, you know, trying to you know build up your product and services, grow your company grow your employees, things like that. Um, you know, now that that may become a, a financial burden, that may be whether it's a small business loan or credit card and things like that. Um, do you have and, and is it still or is it still uh, beneficial to have either a financial business plan or just a business plan? So that way you can say, OK, well, this is our our main you know, MVP. These are our verticals. If we were to able to take, you know, we we're already making this amount every quarter or every year, whatever. If we were to able to take on an infusion of, say, you know, fifty thousand dollars, that would enable us to do these things. Um, with that. And then um, at the end of the year, we'll see an exponential growth of X amount based on our projections, based on our history. Do you as an organization help with that? Or do you, is it, is it the business that's supposed to bring that to you? Or how, how does okay. that, and it, it, all okay. of this is necessary, you know. First of saying. all, that's a wonderful question. And my answer to your, the first question you posed about planning is yeah. Yes. yeah we, <laughs> <laughs> we Me and Trey were like, yes, yes. Yeah, <laughs> yes, you want to plan. Um, because that's going to be critical. I think um, even Jacob said it best. When you're talking about any aspect of planning, Guys, I know it takes time. I know it takes time, but it is critical to your personal growth and your small business growth. I am not a small business owner, but there are many of you out here that are, and many of you are successful. So, you know, when I get, when I get finished, I want to defer to you guys, and I want you guys to explain, you know, how you guys are leveraging uh, debt and leveraging your employees to really help you guys grow. But it all revolves around planning. And then also knowing that you don't have to do this alone. Tapping into resources. There are yep. tons of free resources out here. Many of you guys are on this call that are really willing to share your experiences to help each other. And that's really what it's all about. Now, from a lending standpoint, absolutely. Because yeah. we're managing risk here. Um, and a lot of small businesses don't understand it. I think when... Um, when again, when I spoke earlier about transitioning into nonprofit from corporate banking, corporate uh, corporate banking is all about the bottom line. We have responsibility to our shareholders, yep. and so you know it's not as if it's not to a point to where now there are, there are discriminatory outcomes, but really understanding the game in which you have to play to be able to get access to those funding is, is to, to funds is critical, and it plays out as well on the on the um on the micro level, because we are a micro lender as we are a micro lender as a, as a nonprofit financial institution. So when we're looking at your business, um, you know, we're, we're assessing the risk as well, because that's how we generate revenue. So we want to make sure that even for businesses that, that uh, may not necessarily get access to capital or may not be in a position where they can get approved through a traditional bank, they can come to us and we will look at their business holistically to determine if whether or not it's a viable opportunity. But, um, you know, if, you, if you're not a mature business, well, we can really dig deeper into your financials to determine if whether or not your, your ask is, is feasible or viable at this time, mm -hmm. then those are things that we can work with you to help you get to that point to where you become bankable and eventually outgrow us as a, um, as a smaller lending institution. Um, so all of those points that and the questions that you brought up, Gene, are are are, are definitely very prominent and 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 and, and it really um, speaks to, um, you know, really working with and understanding what your financial institutions, how we go about doing things to be able to service you, because in many cases is not that BBIF may not necessarily want to help your black business. It just might be that you're just not necessarily ready. And we yeah. don't want to give you money that's going to accelerate your demise as exactly. a company. Exactly. So you got to understand that. So it's all about educating yourself, all about coming to when you come to have a conversation with me, that you have a plan and you understand fully exactly how you want to leverage that capital um, to grow your business. Mm -hmm. 
I and I'll defer to that. everybody else. Yeah, yeah. And I know we've got a question. Hold on one second. Mm-hmm. I, Dr. B, I'm going to come back to you in just a second because I, I saw Rose like ready to go. So I know, like, I know, I am, I am. <laughs> because, um, so it's, it's, they're all connected and, I, and I'm going to start, I'm going to try to connect, uh, you know, be real quick and connect this. Mm-hmm. One of the comments that Trey made regarding the PPL loan and how underrepresented communities were not um, a large part of those who received those. And, um, and, you know, in doing, you know, uh, uh, surveys and um, doing research, one of the things that one of the, those reasons, it's not the main reason, not the only reason, but one of the uh, biggest reasons was uh, a lot of uh, underrepresented or, or minority businesses did not have the documentations that they needed. Right. They didn't have a business plan. They didn't have um, the marketing plan. I'll tell you what, one of the biggest things was they were mixing personal finance with business finance. Right. As soon as you do that, you can't, you, how are you producing financial statements and your personal finances there? You're automatically X'd out on being able to receive those funds. So those are things that we've identified, which is why we created the business development program that we have. But those are the things that we need to understand and we need to work on as business owners. You need to have a business plan, even if it's a a one pager, you know, start with the one pager, work towards having that robust business plan down the line. Another thing, having a marketing plan, having a a financial plan or a strategy, those are very important for your business if your goal is to expand, scale up, and get funding. You can't go to a bank and or any lending institution and ask for money and not have those things available. They need to know what your plan is. They need to know that your business is, uh, is viable. They need to know that you actually have a strategy. And a lot of our business, our businesses don't have those. So we need to have those in order to get opportunities that are out there. Sometimes it's not always um, um, uh, prejudice. It's more, you know, it's hard it, it, when, when, if business has not been a part of your language, you know, a lot of the other folks, the business is, is part of their language since they were born. It's been discussed. So they know what they know and they have people to support them. It's hard when you don't know what you don't know. So go out there, find the resources like Trey was saying, get all your stuff together. Then you can go to BBIF or any other lending institution, have your stuff together and be able to get that, that those funds. Um, And so that was the biggest thing I wanted to say, like, yes, we need, you need that financial planning. You need those information, that information. And there's so many uh, resources out there. You may not know of it, but go out there and search and then spread that information so you can get those documents together. Can I chime in there, Gene? Yeah, yeah, please. So uh, when you asked or someone asked a question about financing, whether it made sense to uh, get into debt or not, I'll give you an example. So when we opened our office in um, Orlando, we wanted to grow and expand to South Florida. So we had options, right? If you are in finance lending, you understand there's, you know, equity financing and there's debt financing, right? So for my office in South Florida, we did not do a debt finance. We did equity finance. What I mean by that is instead of getting a loan, we had our employees buy into that business and we were able to raise enough money to open the second location. So we didn't, we don't owe anyone but we've given some equity away to some of our own, uh, our employees and that can work as well. So if you haven't thought about that, or you, if you have partners, you can do debt financing by raising money and giving a small equity of your business away to partners or employees that works really well. The other part is the debt finances. When, when you actually get a loan, for example, I don't know, we have about 31 people, 32 people on this call. I got an SBA loan to get my open my third location. This was a six hundred fifty thousand uh, dollar investment. Um, we would have to, had to sell a whole bunch of stuff to do this ourselves. So I went the SBA route. I'm not sure if anyone on this call has done an SBA loan, but they want everything but your <laughs> DNA. <laughs> they ask for everything but your DNA, but they really do, and they they do it for a reason. Uh, have you? Uh, by the way, I'll continue. But have you done an SBA loan, Al- Al- Alison? Uh, yes, yes, um, yes. We we are an SBA lender, so oh, you are. We're, we're SBA preferred lender, and yeah. um, just like what Socrates mentioned, just really quick, and I'll let you finish, my friend. Sure, sure. Uh, yes, we do ask for a lot of information, yes. and I'll let him explain to you guys why. Okay, so. but yes, we do. We're we're an SBA micro lender. Um, we okay. 
We provide microloans up to $50,000 and through the Community Advantage Program, up to $250,000. Got it. Um, however, um, I don't like to really divulge into putting caps on the type of offerings um, right. that, that we offer through lending because through all of our product offerings, we can, if there is a $650,000 loan, there are, there's ways that we can uh, tap into the funds that we have right. to be able to make, to be able to reach those needs. So just keep those things in mind. So if you're interested, for example, in getting an SBA loan, it is a debt, at, that's a debt financing in that case, just like any, any other lender, as I mentioned before, they want everything except for your DNA. One of the things that a lot of small businesses don't recognize, and I think you mentioned it, is that they're not just looking to see how well you're doing with this, but if you own multiple businesses, there is this thing called global p &L, right? So you might be doing well in one business, but your other business is drying and then together you don't do well. And so they wanted every, uh, I don't know if it's a fortunate thing or not, my wife and I own several businesses. So although I was applying for a loan for one business, they wanted my p &L for everything that we own, every business. They wanted to see if, for example, one business is not doing well, perhaps I'm actually hiding that I'm funneling money from another business and ultimately <laughs> overall I'm not doing well. So they wanted a global p &L. So that's some. those are the languages that Rose is talking about that some of the folks that may not have a business background in, in many cases, uh, uh, perhaps because they're a first generation college student like myself, you didn't have a, a parent or an uncle that has owned a business, a successful business to help you. And that's why I take it. Uh, I'm so um, excited about the fact that I'm teaching at UCF now helping these minority students, because many times they're at a dis disadvantage because they don't have a family member that has run a successful business. So th that's what I wanted to talk about, Jeannie. I think it's important to understand your, your strategy financially. Do you want to finance your business with equity or with debt? Or are you going to go with a normal lender or are you going to go the SBA route? Either way, if you're going to get lending or not, you want to do what Rose mentioned. Make sure that your books are in order, that you're not mixing personal and business expenses. Because at the end of the day, when you have to disclose that information, that P&L, that balance sheet, it may or may not help you with getting funding. Good Correct. Point. And I will also add that um, Rose and Socrates hit it, hit it on the head. Um, you know, really, one of the things that I want you guys um, to understand is that um, it's okay if, you're, if your financials aren't necessarily in order at this particular time. Um, and all of the, the, the jargon, if you will, um, as you grow and educate yourself about these processes, then it won't it won't sound foreign to you guys. Don't be intimidated about not knowing anything as it pertains to understanding your your business operations, your business financial operations, um, or even banking in general, um, because everybody's been there at some point. And you know the businesses that we were able to help co coach and cultivate and grow throughout all of these years, um, had the right mindset and the right attitude. Um, and they understood that they didn't know every everything. They were a phenomenal at what they did. And, um, and that was the reason why they were hard headed enough to start their own business, right? Um, and so, and that propelled them to continue to grow. But then there's certain, it, it gets to a certain point to where you know, really understanding your financials, understanding profit and loss statements and balance sheets and how uh, that uh, understanding that helps you grow your business. But um, but yeah, just keep that in mind. Just have the right mindset, and right attitude when it comes to that. And as you continue to grow, you can understand how uh, leveraging uh, that knowledge can then help you propel to opening a third office. And then you'll be able to take on instruction on how to do that strategically. So hold, hold right there, because right behind this, I want to get I want to get to um, to Dr. B uh, with it, with the question that he has. And then behind after that, I want to uh, introduce uh, a conversation about accountability partners. So go ahead. So really just wanted to jump in for a moment during this portion to give the chamber a plug uh, as as an organization. That's what we're here for, to leverage these resources. And I mentioned earlier in terms of our purpose, facilitating economic development, providing resources. We may not have it all in terms of the boards, but we have these relationships that we can connect you with to make sure you get the access to the information that you need. 
But one of the things that, as Rose mentioned earlier, that we've identified within our community, uh, whether it's Hispanic, Haitian, Caribbean, minority businesses, a lot of time we need transparency. So if you need help, but yet you're ashamed because you're not able to take pay from your job, I mean, you're not able to get pay from the organization that you run, from the business you're running, we're not able to help you effectively because you have to be able to understand the numbers. And if, if you're not, and if you're mingling personal and business as well, it's even harder for you to separate those. So when you come to us for assistance and we're asking this information, you feel we're invading your privacy. And we are. <laughs> but that's the only way we can help you. If you don't know where the issue is, we cannot guide you directly, direct you exactly. perfectly to be able to get the outcome that you want. So to that point, it is important that you associate yourself with organizations. Now, each industry has their own organizations, but we as a chamber, as a community organization, looking for professionals, business professionals, businessmen and women, we invite you to join hands with us so we can further help develop and grow and expand our footprints. Thank you, JB. Thank you. No, no, no. That's 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 a great plug there. I appreciate that. Um, so what I what I this kind of ties into everything that we're talking about here is, is all great. And it kind of ties into um, what I wanted to introduce to all of you is, yes, that it's easy to say that there are resources out there, but it's a little harder to to say exactly what resources you need. Right. Mm -hmm. And so you all mentioned different pieces of, uh, of of documents that you should you know cultivate, you should create or, or find. And I know that some of these are out there if you do some Google searches and stuff like that. So I want to encourage all of you. Uh, I see there's a lot of comments in the chat with with links and things like that for people to connect. Um, but these uh, uh, panel members that we have up here that are speaking, they're, they're speaking from uh, from experience. They've been in the trenches. They know exactly where you're coming from. So, you know, take a moment, you know, make sure you connect with them, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and follow up with them, you know, with even if it's like, like I was saying before, if I was like, you just got a word document and it's like, I just got a couple of things in here. Help me. Where do I? Where do I go next? You know, is this enough? And where, where can I? Where can I leverage that uh, uh, to make this you know more refined? But you got to You got to start the process. It may not be pretty. It's not supposed to be. In, in my opinion, it's not supposed to be comfortable. But that's where growth comes. Um, is 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 out of that uncomfort. So with that being said, um, I'm going to ask each of you as 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 the panel members. You know, how do you uh, how do you approach finding someone to be accountable to? And then I'm sure all of you have people that you're accountable to them, but for the things that you want to do to grow your business and grow and, and, and expand and, 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 and grow yourself personally, um, how do you find someone to have accountability towards to make sure that the things that you said you were going to do and the things, the goals that you wanted to set, uh, to set so that way you're 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 achieving them. You're looking back, and someone else is also seeing. Hey, I've seen when you've grown. I've seen where you're stumbling. I see where you're where you need some assistance. Maybe I can help as a as a as a mentor or I refer someone to you. Um, anyone want to jump in with that? Go for it. Sure. Oh, can I jump yeah. in? Yeah, yeah. You can go ahead. Yeah. I'll go after you. <laughs> sure, sure. One of my favorite quotes is. Uh, the world makes way for a man or woman who knows where he's going. If you haven't heard that quote and you, you, it doesn't, hasn't sink in yet, think about it. The world makes way for a person who knows where he's going. In other words, if you're waiting for the Savior to come, uh, you know, not from a religious perspective, but from just people to just come to you, you have to start, meaning you have to declare your goals because when you do, you will find the universe will come around you. People will come around you to help you with your goals. One of the most important things that I've done is set goals. And I think uh, luckily and, and uh, through hard work and, and dedication, we've achieved many of our goals. Probably the second most important thing that we've done is getting a mentor. But then the most important thing out of all that is getting uh, finding a mastermind group. Mastermind groups are amazing if you have a really good mastermind group where you can share your goals with them that you've already preset and they can help you by asking you whenever you meet the frequency it could be weekly monthly whatever it may be where you have people that are vested in your success asking you and holding you accountable for achieving success uh, as i mentioned earlier i'm part of a mastermind group called the ceo exchange it's a bunch of ceos across orlando the business has to be doing X number and number of employees, whatever. But there are mastermind groups everywhere. Or if you don't know where there's one, you can create one. 
when you create a mastermind group and you specifically are talking to folks that want to help each other grow, you can set those goals and hold each other accountable. The, the, the most important thing you can do, though, is start by writing down your goals. Even if you're not talking to someone who's an accountability partner, but by setting the goals, you're holding yourself accountable. That's one of the reasons why I find a lot of people don't write goals because they don't want to be accountable. Because once you write it, you now have to do what you said you're going to do. And it's kind of difficult to look at yourself in the mirror and say, OK, I said I was going to do this. I, I haven't even started yet. Writing it down is probably by far the most important thing you can do in terms of goal setting and accountability because accountability starts with you. Awesome. So one of the things I'll say is, um, and I'll speak from my perspective, and I think it aligns a lot with um, so, uh, some of the individuals on here. I am the first in my family to do a lot of things. Uh, first born here, first to go to college, first to graduate high school, first to go to college, first to start the business. And being the first, you are most likely that person for your circle, your first circle, your family and your friends. You're that person that they look up to. What we fail to realize is we need someone as we're going through our journey to be that person for us. And so when you talk about that accountability partner, it can't be the person who is looking up to you because <laughs> you get, do you get what I'm saying? It can't be them. It has to be somebody who's already surpassed where you're about to go. And so, and it, and that continues to change because once you reach the next level, now you got to keep going, looking further on. And so I've learned that. And I learned that um, there were certain um, networking events and uh, environments that I needed to be at in order to propel myself that I had to go to, to by myself. I couldn't wait for my friends or my family because they weren't on that that mindset yet. And so that's something I think we really need, need to realize. I think that some people hold themselves back because they're waiting for their family to come with them or they're waiting for their friends to come with them. And it's like, no, most likely you got to be the one to break that ceiling. And so you could bring them along. And so you have to, again, when we talk about mindset, it's not just, you know, when you talk about your business mindset, it's not just in your business, but it also it's also yourself. Getting yourself in those um, organizations are going to help you getting yourself in those networking sessions. That's good where you're going to meet these people. So you got to open yourself to that and you're going to have to put yourself in uncomfortable situations that actually wind up being okay, because you're, a uh, you're going to be in the midst of people who are, have similar goals that you have, and you're going to start getting that sense like, okay, you know, I got this. It's, Running a business is not for the faint of heart. Starting a business, being an entrepreneur, small business owner, it's not. You got to be a, a special type of person to do it because it comes with difficulties. And so uh, sometimes you could be there and you're like, man, this is tough. This is hard. And you want to give up. I have business. Um, I call them my boardroom, my business besties, whatever you you know want to call it, where I go to them and I'm like, look. I'm about to jump because this is hard. People aren't paying their money. It's difficult. I'm about to, you know, you know, have some unkind words with someone, you know, talk me off this cliff and they will, they understand, you know, they understand that um, sometimes, you know, there's a professional way to kind of let somebody know, you know, Hey, I'm about my business. There's, you know, it's different things that they can give you insight on. Not only that, there's things that you don't know. And so they can open up that, that door up to you. So my thing is, yes, you need it. It's not going to be the people that are around you right now. You're going to have to look beyond it. And in order to find them, pe those people that will be your accountability partners, you're going to have to put yourself in different and other situations that you would never find yourself at. Do the conferences that you would never join. You know, do the like travel. I mean, even travel for conferences. I've done it by myself. Winded up meeting amazing people who became my clients. Like those are those are the type of things and situations that you need to put yourself in and just realize that it's not to say don't be your friend. Don't be friends with your you know, folks you've been friends with since college. You just gonna have to have another group of friends who are where you want to be so you can learn from them and bounce ideas and get that feedback that you need. You know, uh, Rose, yeah. I think uh, Rose, Socrates, and Trent, everyone mentioned that. Uh, for me, uh, my accountability partner is the franchise. You know, 
eight years ago, I wanted mm-hmm. to transition. I've been running the business and I've used that word a lot. A lot of time come to realize I was running a hobby, mm-hmm. but it got into the franchise model and having them holding you accountable for your goals, for your expectations, for whatever you state. But also to me, I could say, hey, I'm the best clinician there is in Central Florida and Florida. But when it comes to business, did I, do I have a business degree? No. Did I, did my parents or myself have been involved in business? No. But so this is where you have to identify and, 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 and hold yourself accountable. You have to be, be, be true to yourself as well to understand where your weaknesses are and your strengths are and reach out to those resources. Yes, it's a have to find a pay with the franchise, but what it's doing for me also is training and development and allowing me to achieve my goals. But yet, of course, you have to pay to play. So yeah. wherever you go in this, you want a mentorship, you want yeah. this, you want this, you have to give something. Something has to be given. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and I think that's an excellent point. Um, but sure. you know, let me let me begin by saying um, um my my wife is my accountability partner. I'm looking around, she get on my nerves, but you know, let me let me just okay. So no, but um, but I think I think uh, I mean those are all excellent points, guys. Um, you know what we where we're uniquely positioned at as an organization is to um offer consulting and education and training uh free of charge to small businesses. Um and and in which um, you're talking about uh, meeting with other CEOs. Um, we we have an, a monthly CEO roundtable where uh, individuals such as all of you guys will have an opportunity to share your experiences, best practices, pitfalls, um, everything, the full gamut um, about uh, your what, what you're experiencing to be able to help each other. And I think that's what it's all about. Even if you're in a like-minded industry where you consider that individual to be your competitor, so to speak. Um, but it's all about, um, you know, having a com- taking a community approach to helping small businesses grow. Um, and that's what it's all about. But, you know, um, gosh, I-, I don't think I really have anything to add. I think you know, what Rose spoke to her talking about traveling, really putting yourselves out there, I think is one thing to note, especially as you, all of you guys are small business owners out there. You guys don't have an aversion to risk because if you, if you did, then you would not be working for yourself. And so don't be afraid to put yourselves out there. Um, again, I refer back to my, one of my previous comments, you know, don't be afraid to, to say that you don't know. Um, and, and being able to share those experiences with, with uh, people that can really be in a position to help you guys out. Um, we just so happen to have a fiduciary responsibility to help in the community, but, um, but the others, you know, within this chamber, join, join your chambers. Um, there's a lot of resources there as well, but, um, but all in all, um, excellent points to everybody on the, on the panel. Thank you for that. I got a question up there from Jacob. I see your hand raised. Uh, Jacob, what's your question? Not so much a question. I just wanted to add on to the uh, conversation. Uh, Going back to what I said early on, uh, one of the things that I use on my end as far as accountability wise is that individual developmental plan. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it or have seen one. Uh, it gives you an opportunity to document your strength uh, and your areas of opportunities that you currently are working on. So it's kind of like a working plan. So it may be for six months, it may be for a year. And then you have a list of activities that are, whether or not it's on your weakness, uh, your opportunity areas, you have a list of activities that you're doing to minimize that. You also have a list of activities that you're doing as well to continue to strengthen the areas of your, of your strength. That could also be used from a, a business standpoint where you're using for your business, where you're documenting uh, you, things that you're working on and so on and so forth. It also gives you an opportunity on that same form to put in uh, who are you involving in that activity that you're doing to continue to strengthen your area of strength or, or, or minimize your every opportunity. And it, on that form also to provide you an opportunity to add on, okay, when I've achieved that goal, you can document our achieve. So it's kind of like a working plan that you have, where it's on a personal level, on a business level. So I definitely encourage 
uh, you guys, if you don't have one, to uh, uh, search for one, or I can provide you one. If you could, you could email me, I can uh, send one, a blank one out to you. But that's made a tremendous difference in my business, as well as my uh, personal development. And again, I go back to the point that if the personal development is not there, running the business effectively, you're going to run into a lot of obstacles and run into a lot of issues. So I, 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 uh, stress the, I stress the point of personal development because to me, that's the key to any business success is having that leadership to lead that business. I agree. Thank you for that, Jacob. Really good. Thank you. Anybody else with a, with a comment there to, to, to champion or continue that? I want to champion and comment on what uh, Dr. Idlis said earlier on, and this is going to take us uh, a little pivot, but he said that it's about relationship, right? You probably have heard this before that people like to do business with people that they know, like, and trust. I think in the beginning for me as a business uh, person, as a, as a business owner, I was always marketing and networking for clients, for business. And, and I, I had some mediocre success. But when I decided to stop networking for clients and just to build relationships, everything changed. So when you meet me, I'm not going to sell you. I am not going to sell you. I'm going to get to know you. We're going to get to know each other. And in fact, a lot of our clients are from South America and they do business that way. They like to do business with people that they know before they talk business. And I think, for example, Dr. Idler and I met on the tennis court um, a year ago during the pandemic. And I put together these tennis events. We're not out there trying to get business. We're trying to get to know each other. As a result of that, many of the people who have joined my tennis club are now doing business together because it's important that you get to know people through relationships. Again, it's a, there's a big difference between you networking to get business, almost like you're, you know, uh, if you will, negotiating for, for business cards so you can rush back home and reach out to someone so you can get their business. But when you're getting to know people, things change. For example, Dr. Idler and I met on the tennis court and we, we've been talking over, over the last uh, 14 months or so. And I've joined the Chamber of Commerce. I've been living in Orlando since 2000. I've never joined the Chamber of Commerce, but now I'm a member. And I think I, I wanted to thank you again for putting this event together as the president of the uh, Chamber of Commerce. And you are um, living up to the standards that you talked about in the beginning. It is about relationship. If I, I call them about some random issue with regarding chiropractic services and, and he spoke to me and gave me some guidance. I think it's important as business owners, as we grow, that we look to build relationships. And I, I, I can't stress enough how important that is because uh, when, you're, when you're at a networking event, you, you're busy sh giving out 100 business uh, credit cards or whatever, business cards rather, People know you're just trying to just fly by and give 100, but, but take time to build relationships and that will make a world of difference. So, Mike, I've got one last question for you all. And I think it, you're, you're, Socrates, you're kind of leading into it here. Um, uh, burnout. Um, you guys, and I see a lot of people talking about uh, going to play tennis, so I think that's awesome. But um, as leaders, right, you know, your, your, your people in your organization are looking up to you, people around your community are looking up to you, friends and family and things like that. There's a lot of people that have eyes on you to see, you know, how you're doing. And I, I, can, I can attest, you know, we don't always uh, feel great and we don't always feel supercharged and, and, and things like that. But um, there are times that, you, that, that, that we come close to burnout. Um, how do each of you address that or identify that and recover or recharge? All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna start because uh, I'm gonna say something. Well, maybe not, maybe not in this group. I know uh, sometimes within um, the Haitian culture, even the black uh, black uh, African American culture is taboo. But I do have a therapist. I have been seeing my therapist for two and a half years. I started seeing my therapist before I started my business because I knew that I had to make 
some serious pivots and I had to change my mindset and I wasn't going to be able to, to do that alone because there were certain things that I had been, had grown up with, you know, things that happened that I needed to address and take care of before I took myself into this situation. Like I said before, building, have being a small business owner is not for the weak and you need to like be, you need to be strong um, in order to achieve goals and things that you have. So I encourage it. Um, my mom still doesn't know that I see one because I already know what her response is going to be, but it is something that has helped me big time because having someone that I can speak to about the things that I'm dealing with, and it's not just, um, you know, a typical conversation would be me speaking to her about something I'm going through, um, in the, you know, in the professional business world and how, to address that. She gives me that perspective where she's not a family member because you know sometimes they can be biased in their response to you. There she's not a friend. She's a expert who can help me navigate this um new territory. And so she's been amazing and me keeping uh my mind sound and fit. The other thing that I do is I've been more intentional about not, you know how we used to not, you know, not um, playing into what, in my mindset, what a business owner was before, like grinding. You know, we all say, oh, I, I'm grinding, I'm hustling, I'm doing all this stuff. It was always like these, I, you know, what I realize now are negative words um, because it just, to be a true business owner, it seemed like you had to give all of yourself and everything and leave like nothing, you know, nothing left. And then that would really make you a business owner. And what I learned is that's not, that's not the case. You needed to be, you just like, in, and w with our health, with our mind, everything, you need to be as healthy as you can be in order for your business to succeed. And you are being detrimental to your business if you are not taking care of yourself. So I know when we first started, you're asking, you know, towards the end of the year, what everybody's doing, I'm being intentional in going away, going to some nice place, island, who knows, to go and do my business planning and put myself in that mindset as I go and, you know, think about scaling up and going for bigger things next year. So be intentional about self-care um, in any way that works for you um, and realize that you are connected to your business, your health, your mindset, all of that is connected to your business. And if you're not there in a great condition there, it's going to impact your, your business. Awesome. Nice. 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 That ain't yeah. That's um, I, if I, if I'll jump in, if I may, um, okay. So again, um, I mean, it's been well established that I'm not a small business owner. Um, but I can tell you guys, um, especially during PPP, this entire pandemic, um, our organization is very small. Um, so, you know, in terms of, of, of lending and the amount of exposure we had, we I will always say we were the best kept secret. So just, you know, it was exhausting alone trying to get in front of as many people as we can and say, hey, this is, we're a resource, everybody, we're a resource. You know, that was, that was one of the biggest challenges. But what PPP did was put us on the map and, you know, and it tested our team in, in ways that I don't think we were expecting. Um, and me being a department head, um, small businesses that were in need, they found, they even, I don't even know how they got my personal email. They were, they were, you know, emailing my personal email, LinkedIn, calling me, calling my cell phone, you know, asking, you know, uh, how can I help them? Hey, can, can you help me? Please, please, please. Can you help me? Can you help me? And, you know, and that was thousands and thousands and thousands of calls. And, and so it not only tested me, but it tested my team uh, mentally and physically. And then also, too, you know, my wife is a physician. So we were on both ends of the, the spectrum of this pandemic, both, you know, from a health perspective and an economic perspective uh, with children. So we were just trying to quarantine, you know, and quarantine her all while helping clients at the same time working seven days a week through this process. 
And so, um, you know, looking at it from that perspective, um, when you do what I do, I mean, we're, we, we exist to help as many small businesses as we can. What you also find is that there are many small businesses that weren't able to survive as a result. So when you're listening to stories on a con- eight, 10, 12 hours a day about how people have been adversely impacted due to this um, COVID and their livelihoods being affected as a small business owner, and they're not able to even see their passion or continue their passion, um, it, it it really tests you in a way, especially in terms of your mental health. And I And I did not realize that until, you know, we got to a point to where we can move forward. So, you know, if you have um, individuals that, you know, when you get to a point to where you feel that burnout that you can speak to, you know, um, just like Rose, Rose definitely said it best in terms of self-care and um, paying attention to your mental health, especially as a community, you know, um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not of Haitian descent, but we all family. And I think there are certain uh, intricacies in terms of how we are our upbringing and child rearing that puts us in a position where we always have to appear to be strong and 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 not acknowledge those things until it really really wreaks havoc on or takes a toll on our mental and physical health so you know um you know I, I'm pretty sure all of us as a community that's on this line um is always willing to to listen and, and hear um, and help and help coach people through any through any adversity or adverse issues. But you know, I just wanted to throw that out there. Hello, I'm Dr. Lane Powell, and I'm the vice president at Ace Applications. I'm also the founder and executive director of Tech Sassy Girls a nonprofit organization dedicated to inspiring and empowering first-generation underrepresented girls in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, or affectionately known as STEM. I'd like to thank the Greater Haitian American Chamber of Commerce of Central Florida for the opportunity to speak with you today about the importance of obtaining your certification. ACE Applications is a technology solutions provider for businesses, schools, and government agencies. We deliver custom software, systems integration, mobile app and web development, data analytics and reporting, training, and IT staff augmentation. ACE Applications is a minority-owned DBE and LDB certified company in 11 states. Our clients include Orange County Public Schools, City of Orlando, Orange County Government, Orlando Health, Greater Orlando Aviation Authority, Jackson Municipal Airport Authority, just to name a few. When thinking about certifications, identify which ones are best suited for your business. For instance, should you consider the minority business enterprise if you are a member of a minority group? and own at least 51% of the business? Or what about a disadvantaged business enterprise if you work specifically in transit? Would a local developing business certification, which is race and gender neutral, align more with your company's goals? There are other certifications that exist as well, such as women-owned small business and veteran-owned small business. It's important for you to determine which one aligns with your mission and your strategy for developing your business. If you're in Orlando or Central Florida, I'd highly recommend that you get certified with the City of Orlando and Orange County government, and be sure to check on reciprocity with other agencies you may be interested in doing business with. Most certifications require two years of business existence, but understand the application process for each certifying agency. Understand also the documents that are required. Get your financials in order and use systems to stay organized. Outline your past performance and keep track of it. Most certifications require annual renewals or sometimes even biannually. Be sure to provide the required documentation 
dot every I and cross every T. You don't want your application to get kicked back for something minor. You may be asking yourself, why should I get certified? A certified business is able to participate in an agency's business development program, gaining access to contracts. Prime contractors receive credit for teaming with certified firms, and in some cases, MBEs and women-owned businesses. Being listed in certified business directories where primes can contact you for teaming opportunities is definitely a plus. It's a win-win. Agencies make their small business goals, primes meet their goals, and as a certified business, you earn more business. Certifications are a license to hunt. They provide access to contracts, but it's not guaranteed. Market your certification, your capabilities, and past performance to get business. Relationships are key in building your business. Also, When you are first starting out, review the scope of work to determine if you meet all of the criteria. If not, consider teaming with other large primes. You may not have the breadth of experience the scope of work requires, but you may have key components to do some of the work. Teaming provides a great opportunity to bid together. Time and patience has been of utmost importance. We've had to learn how to work with large government agencies, marketing ourselves as a sub, when initially we started out trying to prime all jobs and lost many opportunities. Once you prove yourself as a sub and gain a few past performances under your belt, then and only then are you ready to provide services as a prime. We're there now and have achieved a number of contracts as a prime, but it took time and patience to get here. In our experience, MBE certifications have allowed us to present this extra qualification when bidding on a project, but it's truly been our capability to deliver great, reliable solutions for our clients that's been the difference maker. The certification just gets you a seat at the table. While the certification process may seem daunting, don't give up, be encouraged. Success will come, but it may take some time. Recognize the value you deliver to your customers and the value you bring to a team and be bold, confident, and communicate it. Sell your services and deliver quality on every engagement. Repeat the cycle and success will indeed come. When we first started ACE Applications 20 years ago, we made a lot of mistakes, but what startup doesn't? We've learned from those mistakes and share as much of those experiences as we can to support other small businesses along this journey. If you've already started your business, congratulations. If you've started your business and you're not certified, what's stopping you? If you haven't started your business, what's stopping you? Don't keep your talents and treasures to yourself, just start. In closing, I leave you with these three tips. Perform at a top level of quality and build a strong reputation for delivering solutions. Market your services to large agencies and primes. Don't be shy. And get certified. Best wishes and good luck to you. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Uh, so I, I thank you all uh, for, for your comments. I, I, I want to uh, give Dr. B one last uh, opportunity to speak um, before we wrap this all the way up. Um, Dr. B, are you around? Yes. Okay, jump in. Hello, real- everyone. Uh, quick apologies for staying over. I know we're slated to finish at 11, but the conversation is so great. The interaction is so live. So again, apology, but thank you for the, well, thank you for staying and Apologies for the inconvenience. Wanted to shift a little bit um, this Monday. Uh, we know the census happened a couple of years ago. Well, not a couple of years ago, um, last year. So the results are in. There will be a series of advisory meeting on redistricting. I'm encouraging you guys, if you're able to attend those meetings, uh, please. Uh, the first one is this Monday at 6.30. I believe it's at the, uh, the Orange County administration building. We know how adversely many times our community is affected. So please get engaged, get involved, uh, be present. Again, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for participating. 
Thank you for the wealth of information and insights. We look to do it again. I encourage you guys to get engaged. And those of you who are not yet a member of the chamber, I would encourage you to get involved, plugged in, so we continue to do the work. Again, thank you, JP, for uh, arranging this, for hosting, and all our attendees. I'll pass it back on to you. All right. Thank you, everybody. So listen, this is gonna this is recorded. And um, uh, so uh, once this is done, we'll, we'll, we'll wrap this up and edit it. And then we'll, we'll include it up on our website. So you'll be able to uh, catch that up. Uh, if again, if you have any questions and you want to connect with us, we've got some links here and uh, all of our panel members and speakers have put their information as well as you as attendees of how to connect with them. So please do that. Um, and uh, we look forward to seeing you guys in the very near future. Thank you, everybody. All right, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Take care.